everyone and welcome. I'm Sonia Dia Kusumadewi, researcher at C4 ICRAF, and I will be your host for today. I'm joining you from Bogor, Indonesia. It's the city where the Center for International Forestry Research is based. And together with our partners from World Agroforestry, No Combine and C4 ICRAF, also with the European New Forest Institute, the Phoenix Innovation Fund CITRA, the Global Landscape Forum, and the Sustainable Markets Initiative, we are very pleased to have you joining us today to discuss the very important topic, putting nature at the heart of our economy. And today, we want to bring partners together to share transformative solutions to some of the world's most important challenges, such as accelerating climate change, environmental degradations, and also loss of biodiversity. And we have a very full program right now with expert speakers from around the world, and they will be addressing the big questions, how can trees and forests help to shape a better world and solve these problems? And we will be also focusing on uh, how this affects the global south. I think this is a very first event of its kind to do so. And during the event, I want you to engage with us and you can type your question into the Q&A box. And if you're watching us on Facebook, please share your thoughts and we will get as many as your questions to our panelists. And on social media, we are using the hashtag, hashtag CBEF2021. Please follow along on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And to begin our digital forum, we are very pleased to have with us His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, who will share his insights about the nature-focused transformation that is needed. And Your Royal Highness, the time is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move from crisis to gradual recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, we have a unique but narrow window of opportunity to transform our economy and to bring forward the changes that have been long delayed and which our society needs in order to create a genuinely sustainable future that is within planetary boundaries. To achieve this, uh, we must put nature at the centre of the circle. And to make this possible, we must act for health and well-being. We must recognise the true value of biodiversity and the fundamental interdependence of all living things. And we must invest in nature as the true engine for a new economy, a circular bioeconomy that gives back to nature as much as we take from her in order to restore urgently the balance we have so rashly disrupted. The advances of science and technology at the intersection of the biological, physical and digital worlds provides the circular bioeconomy with the innovation potential to replace the current fossil-based economy. The pandemic we are experiencing is a symptom of the wider challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss. The crisis caused by our fossil-based economy has peaked dramatically in the past 50 years of intense industrialization. Science also shows that biodiversity loss and deforestation are important factors explaining the emergence and transmission of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. So this current crisis is just another wake-up call demonstrating in dramatic fashion the fact that we are crossing the resilience boundaries of our planet. What we need now, ladies and gentlemen, is a new way of thinking as a basis of a, for a new economic paradigm, one that is circular, not linear, uh, one where prosperity and human well-being takes place within the ecological boundaries of our planet. In other words, a paradigm based on a renewable, regenerative and inclusive economy, powered by nature, and that prospers in harmony with nature. A circular bioeconomy, relying on healthy 
biodiverse and resilient ecosystems offers a conceptual framework for using renewable natural capital to provide a more durable form of well-being through uh, the provision of ecosystem services and the sustainable management of biological resources such as plants, animals, microorganisms and derived biomass, including organic waste. At the same time, the circular transformation of biological resources into food, feed, uh, energy and biomaterials within the ecological boundaries of the ecosystems is absolutely key to move away from an unsustainable fossil-based economy. All of this uh, has the potential to create entirely new sustainable industries and livelihoods. Now, having been engaged in these issues for, I suppose, nigh on 50 years, uh, when I made my first speech on the environment and issues of waste, and uh, having talked to countless experts across the globe, I've come to realize that it is not a lack of capital that is holding us back, but rather uh, the way in which we deploy it. And I must say, in all these years of trying to raise awareness of the crucial need to take action before it is too late, it is only now, in the last year or so, that the level of interest in sustainable investments and innovation has suddenly never been higher. Therefore, to seize the rapidly closing window of opportunity we have before us, we must act and act now. To catalyze the paradigm shift we so desperately need, it is utterly crucial that we connect investments to investable circular bioeconomy solutions. And, and this is why I am so delighted that the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance, as part of my Sustainable Markets Initiative, is working to connect the dots between investors, companies, uh, governmental and non-governmental organisations to advance the circular bioeconomy globally. The Alliance serves as a central hub for supporting an informed transition to a circular bioeconomy that is climate neutral, inclusive and prospers in harmony with nature. If we are to achieve results, we must take the necessary action with speed and determination, quickly and through a multi-stakeholder approach. The time for talking and testing our world to destruction is long past, so I very much hope you will join us in this vital effort as we work collectively to put nature at the heart of global decision-making. And I need hardly say I much look forward to genuinely effective outcomes from this critical conference. Reflections and also for the call to act urgently. And now we're very honored to have with us the European Commissioner for International Partnership, Jutta Urpilainen, who will share her perspective on the importance of the, bio, the circular bioeconomy. And... Dear friends and colleagues, my thanks to the European Forest Institute for organizing today's event on the UN International Day of Forests. Niin metsä vastaa kuin sinne huudetaan. As many of you know, this translates as the forest answers in the same way one shouts at it. Human actions are mirrored back by nature. All actions have consequences. Science warns us of the consequences of the environmental crisis on our planet. We must act now 
and we must act together. The EU's answer is the Green Deal. It is our sustainable growth strategy and blueprint for recovery. The Green Deal is a transformative agenda to tackle climate change, biodiversity loss and eliminate pollution. From biodiversity to sustainable food systems and from climate to circular bioeconomy, we need a comprehensive response. We will only achieve the 2030 Agenda if we ensure that environmental sustainability cuts through livelihoods, economies and resilient societies. Colleagues, bioeconomy is global. So are its value chains and therefore challenges. Our response must also be global. This means working with our international partners to promote a sustainable and circular bioeconomy that creates growth and jobs. This is very much the case with the EU's work on forests. I am committed to work with partners. We will promote sustainable forest management and protect and restore forests. This means also making the most of economic opportunities, for example, of the use of wood for construction and innovative new materials. There are other opportunities as well. Think, for example, what more training and education could do for young people wanting to have a career in sustainable forest management. With Team Europe initiatives, the EU will aim to promote this holistic approach. We will address governance, socio-economic development, climate, biodiversity and deforestation. Dear friends, forests are essential for biodiversity as a resource, as a cultural reference and far more. Let's make sure they still are all that for the next generations. Urbilainen, uh, it's very much highlighting that the European Union is and will play a critical role in these transitions. And before we jump to the discussions, now I would like to invite the director of European Forest Institute, Mark Palahi. He is a leading expert on forests and working with a new vision of the transfer transformational role on how forests can play in fighting climate change and developing a circular bioeconomy. And hello, Mark. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much. Dear Bye. colleagues, a pleasure to be with all of you here today. And, and yes. Yes, Mark, before we start our discussion, maybe could you please enlighten us uh, what does the term circular bioeconomy mean? Thank you, Sonia. Yes, uh, before coming back to your question, let me first thank His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, not only for his great contribution today, but also for his visionary leadership in establishing the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance. Uh, it is a great honor for me to coordinate such an initiative, an initiative that, as His Royal Highness mentioned, is about connecting investors with sustainable investable solutions in order to accelerate the transition from the current linear fossil-based economy towards a circular bioeconomy. Because Sonia, the circular bioeconomy is about rethinking our economic system, a system, remember, addicted to fossil resources and to growth at all costs that has failed to value our most important capital. And in fact, the basis for human health and well-being, nature. So the circular bioeconomy means above all, creating a new economy where life and not consumption is its true engine and its true purpose. Remember that bio means life and biodiversity is the basis for life because it is a prerequisite for life to adapt and evolve in a changing environment. Therefore, a circular bioeconomy ultimately is powered by biodiversity. And a circular bioeconomy is also an opportunity to rethink holistically our land, food and health systems 
to reimagine our cities with ecological lenses, to transform key industrial sectors that will need to become carbon neutral and circular in the next two decades, because biological resources, if managed sustainably, are renewable and circular by nature. And the good news is that with emerging technologies and innovative business models, we can transform them into bio-based solutions to decarbonize our economy and restore biodiversity. All that while creating new jobs and supporting inclusive prosperity. But to put forward such an unprecedented economic transformation, we urgently need transformative policies and massive investments. Transformative policies that understand that the climate and biodiversity crisis are not different crises. They are just different consequences of the same fundamental problem, our linear fossil economy. And we need massive investments, but remember, it does not mean necessarily for massive projects, but rather holistic, inclusive, and well-distributed projects around the territory. So we need investments to cover the whole value chain, from innovation to infrastructures, from human capital to natural capital. And this is what we will be discussing today, how to bring the circular bioeconomy vision to action. But remember that now time is our most scarce resource. So after the discussions today, it will be time for action. Yes, thank you very much, Marx, for very insightful explanations. And maybe now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Robert Nazi. The Managing Director General of C4 ECRAF uh, that has decades of experience in forest management and ecology worldwide from Europe to Africa to Asia and I'm welcoming Robert. Hello Robert. Hello Sonia, apa kabar? Apa kabar? Very nice to see you here with your buddy. And Robert, maybe could you please explain uh, us a little bit about how can developing economies use both the practices of the circular bioeconomy and also the resources of forests and trees, and also how to adapt them to their unique circumstances? I can try to do that in three minutes. And <clears throat> first, of course, also thank you to the URL INS and thank you, Commissioner. It means a lot to have your support for, for this event. Now, when, when we look at the balance between the, the natural and the fossil economy, developing countries rely much more on the former than the latter. As such, they are in a theoretically better position than developed countries to shift from the natural economy based on subsistence farming, traditional biomass use, low productivity, and ultimately leading for degradation <clears throat> to a bioeconomy that relies on renewable resources to produce food energy, products, and services, while minimizing biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. And of course, wood should play a significant role in this shift from the natural to the bioeconomy. Wood is our most versatile renewable material. To mitigate climate change, we have to replace fossil-based material like concrete, steel, plastics, synthetic textile with sustainable renewable material like wood. <clears throat> but to do this, we need healthy forest and a proper mix of conservation, sustainable use, reduced waste, waste and increased efficiency. However, the tropical wood of the bioeconomy must not come from the remnant untouched forest and woodland. They should be protected. It should come from more efficient and sustainable use of the existing managed tropical forest. And if you look at the wood production in developing country, which is about 2.3 billion cubic meter, 1.6 billion cubic meter of 70% goes into smoke with very low efficiency, knowing that one ton of wood gives you about 170 kilo of charcoal and a lot of associated issues like respiratory issue, environmental degradation. Coming back to the timber business, the most efficient sawmill in developing country have about a 50% yield. So each time you produce one cubic meter of lumber, you also produce one cubic meter of waste and sawdust. And generally, someone burned this somewhere near the sawmill. So in 2020, the tropical sun timber sector likely generated around 53 million cube of waste, uh, cubic meter of waste. There is therefore a huge opportunity of having more wood material without having to cut another tree, simply by making processes efficient. And we know how to do that. 
Another example uh, is the proposed Amazon Third Way Initiative, which is a new opportunity to protect the Amazon ecosystem and the indigenous people who are the custodian while developing a socially inclusive biodiversity driven green economy in Amazon. And this can be done by harnessing nature's value through the physical, digital, and biological technology for the fourth industrial revolution. These technologies are increasingly harnessing this natural asset across many industries from pharmaceutical to energy, food, cosmetics, material, and mobility and making profit. So we can do it, we know how to do it. So now let's do it. Okay, thank you very much, Robert. And I would like to thank you again for Mark and Robert. It's very insightful indeed as a starting point of today's discussions. And now I think let's we jump to the discussions. And I would like to start right now with the opening plenary with title, Why do we need a circular bioeconomy? And I would like to inform you that uh, don't forget to put any questions you have for the panel in the Q&A box. And the moderator for this plenary session is Mari Pansar, the Director of Sustainability Solutions at the Finnish Innovation Fund, CITRA. She has 20 years of experience in clean tech business development. And I'm welcoming Mari. Yes, Mari, over to you. A warm thank you, Sonia, and happy International Forest Day for all your colleagues. So I am Mari Pantsar and I lead the Sustainability Solutions team at Finnish Innovation Fund, CITRA. And I want to very warmly welcome you all to our opening plenary panel debate. And for the next 50 minutes, we will discuss why do we need a circular bioeconomy. So as we all know, the bioeconomy is actually the original economy that we have had for thousands of years. Now it is transitioned into substitution of fossil based materials in a shift away from the fossil economy. And finally, the bioeconomy must also become circular. So that is the reason why we are talking about the circular bioeconomy. And we all know that the ecological sustainability crisis with its three di dimensions, climate change, nature loss, and pollution is threatening the foundation of our economy and also our well-being. And therefore, we really need a systemic change towards the circular bioeconomy. And that is what our panel is going to discuss now. So we will discuss what are the key elements of this systemic change. And we will also discuss how we could use the circular bioeconomy as an effective tool to build more sustainable, more prosperous, and also more inclusive societies with plenty of new opportunities for jobs and new industries. So we will discuss how we can do much more in creating synergies uh, to address holistically climate, biodiversity, economic, and also social objectives. And I'm very happy to introduce you our four excellent panel speakers. At first, we have Her Excellency, Minister of State for Environment Nigeria, Sharon Ikeashor. Minister, you are most warmly welcome. We have Akansha Katri. Akansha is the head of a Nature Action Agenda, World Economic Forum's platform, Global Public Good. Welcome, Akansha. And then we have Janet Potocznik who is the co-chair of the International Resource Panel and partner of Systemic. And also Christopher Martius, who is the Bonn Hub leader and managing director of C4 Germany. And in the end of the opening plenary, we also have an opportunity to take some questions from the audience. So please be active and place your questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom. But now, let us start with an intro remarks by Akansha Katri, and she will focus on the new relationship with natural capital, which is at the core of the circular bioeconomy. And Akansha will tell us what needs to change, especially considering the way natural capital has or has not worked for developing countries. So over to you, Akansha. 
Thank you, Murray. Um, and then thank you also to C4 for inviting me and the World Economic Forum for this very, very important discussion. Um, as you mentioned, I think I'll just kick off um, with some ideas in terms of why we need a circular bioeconomy. Uh, we strongly believe that there is an urgent need to rethink our relationship with nature and shift our economic and business model from an extractive relationship with natural resources towards a regenerative or circular relationship. So for the purposes of the next five minutes, I want to cover a few points. One is to raise the question that we today have a serious asset management problem. The second, recognize the unprecedented opportunity that the pandemic provides us. The third is to look at the role of natural capital. And lastly, to see how we can shift the power dynamics between developed and developing countries. So um, it was brilliant to see uh, His Royal Highness Prince of Wales actually kick off uh, this discussion because I also wanted to touch upon the report which was released last month at the UK Treasury, uh, which was on the economics of biodiversity led by Sir Parthadas Gupta. That review is extremely rich in many insights, but one that I want to call out today is that we fundamentally have an asset management problem. Over the past nearly 70 years, we have had an unprecedented increase in economic output and human welfare. The average person has become 4.4 times richer and today lives 25 years longer. Many have called this the great acceleration. However, this great acceleration has come at a great expense to our planet and its resources. Or as Sir Parthadas Gupta says, that our human physical and financial capital has been consistently rising, but the natural capital on which all of these other assets actually depend is declining. So we truly have a lopsided distribution in our asset portfolio. Then looking at the pandemic, one could say that we have an unprecedented opportunity to take a pause, reflect on this great acceleration and ask ourselves that do we need a great reset of our economic model? Because if we look at the world that we want to live in 2030, we clearly are not on the pathway. According to the IPCC, despite our best efforts, we are nowhere on the 1.5 degree pathway. So tinkering a few efforts here and there is no longer an option. What we need is a fundamental shift to how we operate. According to the report that the World Economic Forum released uh, last year, the, entitled The Future of Nature and Business, there is a $10.1 trillion business opportunity, which could create 395 million jobs by 2030, if only we shift towards a net zero and a nature positive economy. There is just one example that I would like to take when thinking about these pieces is what would it take if we were able to transition across all systems and across all sectors? If we look at a sector like textiles, which actually affects all of us individually, um, if we move towards reducing and creating a circularity of textile waste and moving it from 14%, which it currently stands at, to 30%, this could generate a savings worth of $130 billion by 2030. So this is just to say that there is an economic case for moving towards something which is circular and having life as Mark had said, like the bio piece of it at the very center. And the natural capital and nature-based solutions have a very important role in this myth. Because despite our significant advances in technology and best efforts, the material productivity, which is defined as the GDP, relevant to uh, or relative to material and energy inputs, has basically stagnated since the turn of the century. So it's not surprising that a huge chunk of the natural resources, uh, which come from the developing or less developed countries, are at the fundamental core of defining our global economic growth. So global resource extraction actually has tripled in the last 40 years while 840 million people lack electricity. So there goes the point that you were raising earlier, Marie, is that we don't have to only look at our climate and biodiversity goal, but when rethinking the system, absolutely make sure that social equity is at the very center of it. So the question today for our global commons is how do we safeguard our natural assets, incentivize the custodians of our land and marine spaces, to create an economic model that values nature. And we all should accept that it's not going to be easy. 
it is a wicked problem that cannot be solved by any one organization or country or business. It truly requires a multi-stakeholder collaboration, but requires it on steroids because we are really running out of time. One of the pieces that I wanted to raise here is on the external sovereign debt, which for many developing and less developed countries was any which was pretty high pre-pandemic, but today is actually getting worse. Most of those countries are seeking more debt relief, more in, uh, investments, so they can invest in their healthcare and job creation. The international financial institutions, multilateral development banks, and sovereign wealth funds and pension funds have an especially important role to play in this. By committing to instruments such as debt for nature swaps, we can help countries reschedule their debts in exchange for nature-related performance. Because for far too long, we have leveraged physical and financial capital to build economic strength. Can we look at natural capital and its, production, uh, its protection as a contribution to global economy? Because as we have identified, more than half the world's GDP is moderately or highly dependent on nature and its risk. And the second idea that I want to leave everybody with is on nature-based solutions. That if you look at examples like Costa Rica, where carbon finance has actually supported urban development, forest conservation, and education, can we learn from these examples? Because we have never had this opportunity to facilitate a significant economic wealth transfer from the developed countries to the developing countries in exchange for the ecosystem services, such as carbon sequestration, rainfall patterns, soil health, which are fundamentally provided by most of the developed countries, which are rich in forests, rich in natural capital, but not as rich in terms of economic growth. So I think that those are some of the ideas that I want to leave us with. And I'm looking forward to discussing this with my very esteemed fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akansh, for the very valuable insight. So we will come back to these important issues that you raised later in the discussion. But now we will move forward. And I have a pleasure to invite Her Excellency Minister Sharon Ikeashar. So thank you so much, Minister, for joining us. And my question to you is that even with ambitious global climate agreements, the greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. As Akansha mentioned, we are nowhere near the 1.5 degrees path. So for your country of Nigeria, how can the circular bioeconomy provide a better alternative for sustainable development, more jobs and also growing economy? Over to you, Minister. Thank you very much, Marie. Well, we all know that uh, climate change is a major threat to sustainable development. But the, like they say, a quarter of the global greenhouse gas stem from land use, including the conversion of uh, forest and uh, agriculture and uh, destruction of our mangrove forests, the draining of our peatlands. So restoring the sustainable management of the world's ecosystem could provide more than a third of our climate uh, mitigation solutions. So we here in Nigeria, we realize that nature is essential to us achieving a sustainable development. So how do we tackle the biodiversity that is declining? Well, our present uh, economic models we have seen threaten nature and our future well-being. So this transition to a circular bioeconomy, it's a model that builds on nature. And we realized that. So for us in Nigeria, this would help us uh, fight poverty, help development, and also help us with the sustainable forest management uh, management that we all know are interrelated. You know, a majority of our people in uh, our communities here in Nigeria live in forest dependent communities. So if we come through uh, restoration of degraded uh, landscapes, we can definitely drive uh, economic development and create uh, employment. Also, biocircular economy will provide Nigeria an opportunity to experience industrial and technological transformation. Since bioeconomy, biocircular economy depends on technology, but on one hand, it still relies on uh, traditional uh, 
methods which we have in abundance in Nigeria. So this technological transformation should be able to enable us make the best use of our biological resources such as wood and bamboo to produce uh, products that can grow our economy. Then uh, another area I would look at is how do we now uh, maximize the value of our forest-based products, you know, to compute with agricultural products in sub-Saharan Africa, and also to compete with the profits of illegal activities in our forests. If we want biocycle economy to work, we have to look at these issues in Africa. Then uh, biocycle economy would help us in contributing to climate change mitigation, like I said. You know, and we'll have numerous opportunities for go, uh, job creation and economic growth that will exist along the my, uh, biomass uh, value chain, you know, from biomass production to agriculture. Then uh, we're looking at uh, having a value chain in our palm oil produce, you know, which we can use for food, detergents, palm kennel to generate heat, to processing plants and all that, and having uh, fertilizers applied back to the farm. So I would believe that uh, the biocircular economy will contribute greatly to achievements of our SDGs, most uh, specifically on uh, uh, poverty, zero hunger, good health, well-being, gender equality, and of course, uh, SDGs uh, 12, 13, and 14. So I'm glad that we're having this com uh, conversation, but how do we also get governments to measure and value their nature capital in Africa? It's a question I'm throwing to the economists to help us out with that. We, the policymakers, will see how we'll marry all this uh, uh, together. Over to you, I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Minister, for this extremely valuable insights, and especially thank you for highlighting the interlinkages between environmental, social, and economic aspects. And I can tell you that you mentioned that we should find an answer to the question, so how we can get the governments to value the natural capital in Africa. But that is not only a problem in Africa, so I, I guess that is a global problem. So I hope that we in the panel, we can discuss about this issue. But if there are any comments or remarks from other panelists, so please feel free to take part in the discussion. So we still have some 20 minutes to go before the audience questions. So there is nicely room for discussion, but I kindly ask everyone want to uh, be very concise so we can get a number of remarks. But next, I would like to give the screen to Janet Potocnik by asking Janet that a circular economy will change the use of natural resources, as we have heard earlier today. So can you explain how it would or should do it? And can you give some concrete examples, for example, from Europe and what we can learn from those? Over to you, Janet. Thank you, Mari, and uh, hi, everybody. In the Global Resources Outlook uh, International Resource Panel, which is a natural resource management UNEP science-based interface, has estimated that if following the current trends, sorry, that if following the current trends, the global material demand is projected to double by 2060. In no way we can decarbonize all the production and make our economies and societies sustainable without massive trade-offs. Therefore, the only realistic chance for reaching our 2030 and 2050 targets, climate included, is to deploy all measures possible to address this likely potential increase. This means that while we strive to improve our well-being, we have to reduce the need for additional virgin natural resources as much as we can, decouple growth from natural resource use and environmental impacts. How could we reduce these impacts in a systemic way? Most effective way is to start at the end, where the product systems meet the societal need with a question. Let's take an example of houses and vehicles. 
how many of them are actually needed and used? And could we redesign these systems in a more efficient way? And here is where natural resource management and circular bioeconomy as an important instrument comes into play. There are great opportunities across sectors to design and create better and smarter. Cities can become more compact and buildings more space and material efficient at high living quality. Transport can become shared, connected, more integrated to avoid cars standing around empty and clogging traffic, saving massive amounts of materials. This would also free up space for nature. Of course, also the production and systems elements like houses and vehicles must become cleaner using renewable energy and alternative materials like bio-based materials. But once we have designed the systems better to service societal needs at minimum resource input, there is much less production to be cleaned up. Interestingly, current climate policies mostly start from the other end of the picture. They first ask how to clean up energy production and how to use cleaner energy in production, not asking how much of that production is useful for society in the first place. More and more, they do indeed start looking at energy efficiency, but they barely look at how could the system, such as housing or mobility, be more resource efficient as a whole, avoiding energy intense use and production in the first place. There is a double benefit to such circular measures. And these are rarely talked about, not even if I'm frank inside, let's call it our circular community. What I mean is the inherent synergy between systemic dematerialization measures and operational energy use measures. A double win for climate, biodiversity and pollution and a double chance for humanity to win the climate battle and improve human well-being. So we should start from improving our well-being and meeting human needs rather than from overuse and underutilization of natural resources, chasing higher production growth rates and the logic of putting more products on the markets regardless of the price we are collectively paying. And I'm not talking about degrowth concept, rather about fundamental system change approach following our needs. Of course, one has to acknowledge that challenges are not the same for all the countries and that major task is on developed part of the world with higher environmental and consumption footprint. But circular bioeconomy, as we have heard from the minister, it's a great opportunity also for developing countries to avoid mistakes done in our regions. I have to add that important developments were triggered lately in Europe, in Europe by so-called European Green Deal, which is a new growth strategy acknowledging that environmental and economic goals are not in contradiction, setting zero net emissions of GHG by 2050 and introducing also the need for decoupling growth from resource use based on circular bioeconomy, and of course, acknowledging also the need for fair and just transition. Back to you, Mari. Mari, we don't hear you. Unfortunately, thank you, Yanis. I have some technical difficulties, so I was away from, from the line for a couple of minutes. So I'm sorry for not hearing everything that you mentioned. But um, uh, next, I would like to move to Christopher Martius, and we would love to hear your view on what does the current science and research tell us about the circular bioeconomy's uh, benefits if it is implemented and what kind of new research needs to be done. And then we would very much like to hear your view also on the definitions. So do you think that we have commonly shared definitions for the circular bioeconomy? So over to you, Christopher. Thank you very much, Mari. Um, these are huge questions. I'm not sure I can answer all of them, but uh, some of them. I have a slide which I would like to share if that can be shown in the background, because I would like to uh, give some background on our new program on bioeconomy bio landscapes uh, that we develop as a 
is what we call it a, a transformative um, partnership platform. Um, and it has three large elements. Uh, one is called common ground, where we look at these large questions. Uh, Janis just, just mentioned uh, uh, that nobody questions the, the amount of energy actually being used and whether we really need all this energy. And similarly, we, are also, we, we can also ask what are we producing and what for and under, under which conditions. For example, uh, palm oil is coming from Asia to Europe to, uh, uh, to support European green fuel policies, but actually generating a lot of emissions back uh, where, it is, where the oil uh, is being produced in Malaysia and Indonesia, for example. Or um, maize is being produced to a large amount globally uh, going not serving as food security, but actually going into, um, uh, into uh, sugary drinks. So is that food security? No. Do we need all this land to, to, for, for this maze then? Perhaps not. I think these are the big questions we need to address through research and modeling. Um, then we also look at something we call going green. We, we see a lot of new technologies coming up. Uh, softening, making and transparent wood textiles and so on. And th these offer huge opportunities to, uh, to replace fossil fuels and replace cement and plastic. Uh, and uh, also linking this with uh, health and diets coming from forest and uh, forest based products. So we are, we are looking at, at these elements and particularly how this relates to uh, circular bioeconomy in developing countries and how this can, this technology progress can be made available in developing countries very soon. And third is what is in the middle here, weaving together, uh, adding value locally, not shipping out raw materials and then adding value somewhere else, but adding value in uh, developing countries where the, where the products come from, pooling resources, reducing waste, of course, we know that a lot of uh, food uh, is, for example, is being wasted and, and um, that generates emissions. Robert mentioned in the beginning, uh, a lot of wood is being lost in the process and that also generates additional emissions that we may not need to produce if we could be more efficient. And also bringing in the private initiative and, and, uh, and capacity development and other elements to, to scale things out very quickly in an action-oriented support. So we, we believe what, what you see down here that, we, that substantial emission reductions can be achieved through this, what, what I call the uh, the, the overlooked pathway um, uh, of, uh, of emission reduction. Uh, you see, I made a very big back of the envelope calculation. I think some 10 gigatons per, per year can be saved. And that, if you link that to the emissions gap, you see there's, there's a huge potential here. But it also could create an adaptive, just, and social transition. Uh, if we look at uh, social elements at the same level as at bringing nature into, into this. And this is what we have done in, in our uh, report uh, we just launched yesterday. Uh, Sabrina Rosa, who is an author from the University of Helsinki and myself, uh, and, and Shiana, Shiana took a desk study of uh, the social aspects uh, of, for, of a forest-based economy in Sub-Saharan Afri Africa. And mind you, this is a literature study uh, we looked at, um, at some 300 papers or so, uh, and, and we, we found out that bioeconomy activities in forests in Sub-Saharan Africa are still mostly traditional, as was expected. There's nothing really innovative or not much. Uh, and that social data are not very easily available. Many people talk about them to justify their studies, but data are not often there. The data that are there, the outcomes are slightly more positive than negative. Um, and this refers to income, jobs, better market access, tenure and distribution of benefits across the population. Uh, but uh, when there are negative outcomes, they are associated to natural resource loss due to overuse, dispossession of people and, and displacement of people. So land grabs are a huge problem. Um, also, we find that progress is held back by unaligned and uncoordinated policies in the forest area, but also development policies. And this uh, requires more work. And finally, the unsolved problems of rights, tenure, graft, elite capture, 
uh, also hamper progress. So we, we see really that, that bioeconomy approaches could have benefits and particularly if we move into more uh, forward looking approaches and, and modern approaches, but they need to uh, solve these underlying and, and still existing big problems in the transition process. So equal to, to nature, uh, social inclusiveness must be at the heart of bioeconomy, otherwise uh, it will not move forward in countries which are st stricken by, by poverty and, 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 um, and missing, uh, missing policies and, and, and so on. Uh, you can find the report online and at the link here. Uh, it's also shown behind me and on, on, this, on the slide. And uh, actually we invite everybody to join us on this, uh, on this, on this partnership. And uh, so for that, please contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for mentioning this very important report. And as you mentioned, the circular bioeconomy offers a promise of improved well-being. So what do you think? How would this actually work in the global south also? So, and what needs to be done in order to ensure this? Is, is this a question to me? It is to you, Christopher. Thank you. Um, I think a, a huge concerted effort needs to be done to, uh, to actually, actually solve these social problems uh, alongside the technological problems. We are, we are often, uh, we are, progress is often seen as mainly technological and uh, very often engineering solutions are seen as, as, as taking us forward. Everybody has seen the advent of of uh, huge, uh, huge giant steps of, uh, of digitalization in the last 20, 30 years. And basically we think the speed can be as quick in, in, the, in the social area, but it is not, it takes a long time. It takes a, a, a very patient uh, work uh, dealing with, uh, with many uh, communities and, and with many stakeholders and bringing everybody to the table. And, um, and so it's a long-term process uh, that re that requires long-term investments and uh, and in, into these processes, not necessarily finance investments, although finance investments are also urgently needed. That is sure, and 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 we also need to 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 step up the the the, the financial input here in order to to make progress. But I think uh, financial and social and policy development have to have have to go hand in hand. Thank you so much, Christopher. So do we have any comments from the other, other panelists to this? For example, Janet, would you like to comment uh, what Christopher just mentioned from the perspective of the European Green Deal? Oh, I think uh, Christopher was quite clear about that. I think it's essential. For me, what is essential, it's really that uh, we start uh, addressing those questions collectively together, uh, because if we don't do that, uh, uh, waiting uh, one to another will not end up well. So are there any other comments? So Akansha, would you like to comment what has been mentioned? Uh, sure, I just wanted to compliment uh, what has been said and reinforced um, what Jana said as well is, um, Yes, there is uh, instruments which are required to be changed. Yes, there are fundamental shifts which are required at the macro level, uh, but, but we should also not underestimate that it requires a shift in the way we look at our lifestyles, our economy and our politics. I think to the point that Yanis was raising, we need to shift away from um, this uh, increase like productivity but productivity from a pure numbers point of view. Uh, and then it, it start more from a well-being perspective rather than how much you're consuming uh, in the new economy. Um, and the second would be, how do we institutionalize this whole natural capital accounting or natural capital protocol, both in terms of mm -hmm. public sector decision-making of governments as the minister had uh, raised earlier, but then also for companies, like how do we get them to report on environmental p &L as well as their externalities? Um, so, yeah. So thank you, Akansha, for mentioning the role of the company. So, Quite often we hear that relying only on the interest uh, by businesses will not solve these ecological challenges in time. So what do you think, what kind of carrots or even sticks 
what we need in order to get this business transition to happen quick enough. Uh, okay, um, so um, I think uh, most of you would be aware of uh, this movement and platform which was started called Business for Nature, which has received more than 500 companies actually signing up for an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So what we are hearing increasingly, and definitely there is a little bit of a bias with more European companies, asking for more of a political policy will uh, to make sure that there is a level playing field because whether we like it or not today, most companies are, um, they have a statutory obligation to maximize profit and maximize margin uh, if they have to report back to their shareholders. Um, so we need to change that and make sure that it is um, baked into policy regulatory environment that businesses are as responsible for the environment as they are on the profit and loss. Um, and then the second thing would be just the way the finance flows uh, is we have to defund activities which are harming nature. Uh, so this includes both from the public side of harmful subsidies, but and then also in terms of the private side, which we are increasingly seeing in European companies choosing to not import uh, deforestation, choosing to reduce their climate and uh, biodiversity footprint. Um, yeah, so I think the businesses need level playing field, uh, incentives for doing the right thing, uh, and a little bit of a stable environment um, and stronger institutions, particularly in uh, developing countries. Thank you so much for that, Akansha. So next question I would like to ask Minister Ikeachar. So what kind of uh, new opportunities would you like to see in Nigeria in this circular bioeconomy shift? Over to you, Minister. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks Marie. I mean, and thanks to everyone who has spoken. Well, the opportunities I would like to see in Nigeria with the bio-secular economy uh, shift would be opportunities in afforestation and reforestation initiatives, you know, that has the aim of income generation and ecosystem restoration, you know, because this would improve the community's resilience and their poverty conditions as well. And uh, having employment opportunities uh, in rural and coastal areas. Like for instance, in Nigeria, we have the largest mangrove ecosystem in Africa. And I think the third in the world. And a lot of our uh, coastal communities rely on the mangroves for their livelihoods. So if we have a restoration and uh, conservation uh, initiatives going along the coast, it will improve uh, the livelihoods of the people there. Another opportunity I would like to see with the bioeconomy uh, bio shift would be an opportunity to tackle economic gender inequality. And I want to see where women are more involved at the grassroots in biomass utilization, you know, both for domestic and commercial purposes. Then also opportunities to set up uh, bio refineries, you know, where biomass from a range of sources such as crops, wood, forests, and agricultural residues are converted to everyday products to us. But this shift to biocircular economy, of course, requires uh, funding and investments, especially in low and medium income communities. So we'll be needing, in Nigeria, we'll be needing a lot more public and private sector partnership, you know, committing to this uh, transition. And I'm glad to hear everyone talking about the transition being just. Then also another opportunity I would love to see, and I want to learn from CIFO how they did it in other African countries, is how we improve the quality of life for smallholder and local communities by targeting food, nutrition, security, and health. I mean, under health, I would look into uh, efficient cook stove, clean cook stove, then uh, market uh, and income diversification. You know, how we get uh, biomass-based value chain 
from things like plantain and cassava that a lot of our people uh, farm with. So I will end by saying, uh, I would like us all to urge governments globally, you know, if they measure, record and account for natural capital in their budgets, they'll be able to make better investments into biosecular economy. So I'm glad that we're all here today and I'll call you all progressive stakeholders as we raise the ambition and commitment towards the net zero nature-based positive economy, you know, to help us build an equitable and resilient world. So I just hope this would gain traction in the global South because we be at the brunt of climate change and climate injustice. So over to you, Marie. Thank you so much, Minister. So it is time to take some questions from the audience and we have uh, plenty of those. So thank you for these. So the first question is that how can indigenous groups as well as small communities be protected and involved in sustainable economic activities when there are large, large companies who have more capital? So who would like to start? Maybe I will ask Janet. Sure, I can start. Uh... I have seen that we already have more than 100 questions, which it's quite encouraging, to be honest. But uh, but I think uh, the question is, of course, excellent, because I think it's pointing us to the very essence of how we are driving incentives on our market economies and why some things are so attractive for producers and some things are less attractive also for consumers. So, And I, I firmly believe that we need to find a way how to together fix these global market failures. Uh, we actually live in market economies where signals to market players are essential for our behavior, as we know, and these big companies are part of that. And we should stop giving producers the signals that destroying natural capital is free of charge and how to value natural capital, which we discussed before. It's of course, central part of that answer. And we should stop confusing on the other hand, consumers by asking them to behave more responsibly, but again, charging them more if they do so. So until we actually, until uh, uh, producing in, in healthier and environmentally more responsible way is less attractive and buying that kind of goods, it's also less attractive, we have a problem. So I think uh, fundamentally with all the government policies, regulation, public funding, and the things which we try to introduce there to remedy this, this mess on the markets, we basically, we basically have a lot of confused uh, players on the market, on the production and on the consumption side. And we simply have to go to fundamentals and to address them. And uh, that will also give the right incentives to these big companies, which would, on the other hand, also protect then the intrinsic populations and uh, uh, the value of natural resources, which they have, and uh, also give them a better opportunity that on the basis of that natural resources, which they possess, they would have a better life comparing to, uh, to the situation today. Thank you so much, Janic. And another question from Marlon is that is wealth transfer from the developed world to the developing world a necessary constitutive element of the circularity of the circular bioeconomy? Wealth transfers, are they necessary? Would Akansha, our minister, like to answer this question? How do you see the role of wealth transfers? Maybe I could kick off and then invite the minister to compliment uh, or disagree with me. Um, so I, I think the point on wealth transfer is a really important one um, and does not get enough attention as it should. Um, and if we actually move towards the circular bioeconomy and start valuing natural capital assets and holders and people who safeguard the natural capital asset 
that gives us a unprecedented opportunity to pro to support and facilitate the wealth transfer from global north to global south because today that is not the case today it's the owners of financial technological and physical capital who are sort of calling the shots of the global economy however if the anchor and the underpinning infrastructure of a global economic paradigm shifts towards natural capital it allows developing countries and even indigenous people to come to the table with more of a right as well as um uh, an ability to almost call the shots so we would think uh, that is definitely um, the future that we need and we see um, and then the last point that i would mention for this wealth transfer to happen we need to also fix the market for ecosystem services because today we don't value natural capital or the ecosystem services and therefore it's impossible to put a dollar value on it um so yeah i guess it requires fixing the market and um, giving equal seat at the table to owners of natural and financial capital thank you so much akansha would minister ikasa like to add something to this question. Yes, I do agree with Haka. Do you hear me? I'm having problems with my connection. I couldn't hear the question very well. What so when, I was looking Yes. Go ahead again. Turn off again. Mari, you are muted. So we were talking about wealth transfers. Are they needed from the global north? to the global south in order to accelerate the transition to the global circular bioeconomy you're muted now minister yes def definitely we would need uh, the welfare to be thought out and for the global north to take uh, responsibility and help to fund and invest in biocircular economy in the global south because that would be a good incentive for them thank you so much for the answer you it did thank you so much and we have a final question from the audience to Christopher. So the question is from Etna and it says, as an economist, I just want to know whether there is em empirical data to show the feasibility of the concept or rather any business model in order to show the linkages of how the transition will benefit people. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, uh, the the problem is i think what we have shown with our little little desk study that data are not readily available and maybe it's uh, it's different if you look at other regions of the world uh, than sub saharan africa but I, i i suspect it's probably going to be quite similar nobody's looking into this really uh, no, we don't have global data and we are we're just we're still just starting to develop these these ideas for example the idea of uh, global demand the, uh, land availability availability of wood which will be part, which will be subject of the next panel actually and um, there is some some work now being developed between C4 and EFI but and and probably many other players but but um, we still and and this is part of the this is part of the objective in our program we want to close those gaps because we don't see Uh, we don't see enough uh, enough information on on the subject but uh, the situation is 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 changing uh, uh, circular bioeconomy is right now on vogue so to say and uh, there's a lots of thing going of, of things going on and and i'm sure we will be bit, be much smarter five years down the road thank you thank you so much christopher and the final comment from janet you're welcome and you are muted yeah yanets correct mari <clears throat> i would just say that it it's not we are not so naked i would say as economists in responding to that question so there are many analyses which are very clearly saying that 
at least if we measure from the economic growth rate possibilities, that there are major opportunities of the transition. And like in any transition, which has ever been, of course, this is in an opportunity for innovative people. So one should not be afraid of that and should basically uh, go. So we have a bit less clear, uh, clear answers when it comes to the employment. And uh, we are currently uh, very actively working also on that. The thing which we basically know is that uh, circular bioeconomy it's providing more local connected jobs, which in a way it's a good positive answer uh, in the context like the question was asked. But if I want to finally just the last sentence to say as an economist to an economist, because this was actually a question from my colleague from, from the economy, my answer would be the benefits which we talk about are the benefits how humanity will survive. If this is not enough, then let's rather look our, ourselves, economists, in a mirror and try to create an economic theory which will, be, which will be sustainable with humanity in the future. Because currently what we are teaching in the schools, it's simply not. Thank you so much, Yanis. And, and this discussion is really so inspiring that I would love to continue this for, for a much longer time. But unfortunately, we are coming to an end of our panel debate. And I want to take the opportunity and thank you very warmly, all the panelists and also the audience for, for, for the excellent questions. So as a short wrap up, um, I would like to uh, praise that we of course, understand the importance of putting nature in the heart of our economic system. And, and it has been mentioned many times that business as usual is no longer an option, but we really need to price externalities. In the climate side, uh, pricing exter externalities is a bit easier than what is uh, on the nature side. But regardless of this, we just have to find ways how to do this. And then it is very important that when we talk about the transition towards the uh, circular bioeconomy, we talk about global, uh, lo uh, local jobs and local sustainability, local prosperity, and then also how these locals connect to the wider global system. And as in every transition, we need all the stakeholders on board. So we need international institutions, we need international collaboration, states, governments have been mentioned many times, communities and local, and local people also. But with these words, I would like to once again thank you all and hope that you have an opportunity to follow the rest of the uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mari, and thank you to the panelists for that very inspiring discussions on the importance of circular bioeconomy and its relevancies for better global and local economy. And we are getting lots of questions on Zoom and Facebook. Thank you very much for engaging with us, and we will try to answer as many as possible. Maybe if not right now, uh, we will do after the event. So please keep raise your thoughts and questions. And now, before we move on to the next sessions, um, we will take a short uh, break for 10 minutes. Uh, we will come, uh, when we come back from our break, uh, our next panel will tackle the critical issue where, of whether the world will have enough wood for this economic transition. So please stay tuned uh, and we'll come back in 10 minutes. Uh, see you soon. Twice a week, Joseph and Bea trudges purposefully into the forest, 
a few miles south of his home in the lee of Mount Kenya, to forage for roots, bark, sap, and leaves. His neighbors find this behavior a little odd, and his esoteric knowledge of the trees and plants eccentric. Most of them would choose paracetamol over his herbal concoctions of steeped and infused teas. Yet, among the cedar, rosewood, waterberry, and stinkwood trees, the 64-year-old finds treatment for arthritis, toothache, ear infection, upset stomach, and even prostate cancer. Mbeya's knowledge of and communing with the forests flanking Mount Kenya's craggy peaks is part of a value system that sees trees as being worth more than just timber or charcoal, that understands chopping them down has a cost to ways of living, and knowing that this outstrips the market price. Scientific research has caught up with traditional thinking. A recent study by the Center for International Forestry Research, C4, and the Kenya Forestry Research Institute, KEFRI, identified both the value of Kenya's Afro-Montane forests and the threats to them. But such beliefs are fast fading. There were aspects of the tradition that were helping conservation of the environment. The Mount Kenya Trust is a charity that works with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Kenya Forest Service to conserve the mountain ecosystem and improve the lives of those living around it through tree planting, family planning and income generating activities. Increasingly modern conservation methods recognize the value of traditional knowledge of the land. It used to be known that God lived on the icy scarps of Kirinyaga, Mount Kenya's original Kikuyu name, and the people lived below, farming and herding on its slopes, but rarely venturing into its sacred upper realm. But then the colonialists arrived, bringing Christianity and taking land, leaving less space for a growing population. Old beliefs faded, the land became crowded, and the mountain's forest became just another resource to be exploited. Wildlife was hunted and trees cut down for firewood, charcoal, timber, or to make way for homesteads and agriculture. The old men used to believe that is where uh, God is and it's a sacred, sacred place that needs to be uh, respected by all. Those traditions are kind of being eroded. And uh, when they get eroded, they are eroded with the benefits that they used to carry in conservation. But the old ideas of managed access, sustainable use, and respect for the forest and its trees are beginning to show signs of a comeback. Samson Thurai was born in 1923. Over his many years, he has gained too many grandchildren to count and lost every one of his friends. Deep inside the forest that ring the mountain, a hallowed sense of wonder persists. In the old growth Marania forest, thickly towering trunks of rosewood, cedar and olive are draped with lichen and moss carpets the earth, contributing to a cathedral silence. It is otherworldly, the ground soft underfoot, the trunks damp to the touch, the trees centuries old, the sunlight breaking through in narrow shafts, and the temperature several degrees cooler than the outside. David Moeraria, a 25-year-old forest ranger, patrols in Marania. It's his job, 
but doesn't feel like it. At the Amenti Forest, a wooded peninsula on the mountains north, connected to the other reserves by a narrow spit of forest, another ranger, Harun Metwiri, is also out on patrol. The 32-year-old shares his colleague's passion for trees and forests. Mutwiri wades through, grasping weeds and over loose basalt rocks to where charcoal burners recently abandoned a kiln, one of more than 20 found in this patch of forest this year alone. The diminution of Kenya's mountain forests has local and global impacts, affecting rainfall patterns, river flow, erosion and carbon sequestration. It's not just about the trees and the wild animals in the forest, but also the people living around the Mount Kenya ecosystem. This concept is manifested in a rehabilitation program that sees local residents nurture seeds, plant trees, and oversee their growth in exchange for cash and the right to farm within prescribed areas of the forest. We know if we decide to plant the trees with other communities, the survival rate of the trees planted don't be as high as opposed to when we have the communities involved. At the Katinka Tumaini Tree Nursery, a 15-person cooperative on the mountain's northern fringe, indigenous trees are collected from the forest by hand as inch-tall wildlings and then grown in the nursery for six months before being planted. Mount Kenya Trust then buys the knee-high seedlings back at 15 shillings each, bringing in around 64,000 shillings for the group. In addition, the growers are permitted to farm within the forest boundaries as part of what is known as the Shamba system, planting potatoes around the young trees that they are responsible for looking after. At nearby Kiambogo in the Ontolili Forest Reserve, tree planting is underway to rehabilitate the once denuded landscape of a cypress-lined half-acre Shamba a few hundred meters from the forest edge. Muti kiki to me tenju itikia. Uni di danga akwa. Imutu wa te mona di joa akwa. Di danga akwa mutu na joa akwa. Tontu di joa te moa. Joa tu lo embau. Biki lo muti na jura mucho lo kotu di kona. To di kona ju.
welcome back and I hope you are ready now for the next sessions and after these sessions we will have a video question from the audience so please stay tuned and the next sessions uh, we have very a uh, very interesting topic uh, will there be enough food and our moderator is uh, Joe O'Hara formerly a senior forest executive with the Scottish government. She's a professional forester and a coach working internationally with governments, academics, and organizations to support the progressions to a climate positive future. And I'm welcoming you, Joe. over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks for that, Sonia, and hello everybody uh, from Scotland. So we've got a really interesting session this afternoon, um, following on from just a really interesting discussion earlier before the break about the whole system um, of the bioeconomy. We're now going to focus in on the uh, supply side. So answering the question and discussing the question, will there be enough wood? I'm very pleased to be joined by um, four, I'm very honoured to be joined by four uh, panellists. We have um, Minister Dr. Mujawa Maria from um, Rwanda, who is the Minister for Environment. We have Larry Hetemeki, who is the Assistant Director for the European Forest Institute. We have Michael Allen Brady, who is the team leader, value chains, finance and investments from C4. And last but not least, Pina Gervasi, Director of Climate Change with the Forest Stewardship Council. Welcome everyone. And I hope this is gonna be an enjoyable and fruitful discussion. So to start off with, demand for roundwood to supply energy and materials is expected to increase significantly in the coming decades as fossil-based raw materials are replaced with forest biomass and wood products. The reality, however, is that there are currently no systematic studies offering up-to-date outlooks on the implications of the forest bioeconomy development for global forests. So in this session, we aim to bridge that gap in understanding and offer insights into demand and supply for forest biomass as part of the shift to the circular bioeconomy, which as we've heard is so vital. This will include reflections on how sustainable wood supply should be reconciled with biodiversity protection and providing inclusive prosperity for local communities. So to get us going, I'm now going to introduce uh, Larry Hetamaki to give us a scene setting introduction um, about these supply questions. So Larry, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, that's coming through well. Okay, great. So I will be asking the question, is there enough wood to support the bio-based circular economy? Before starting to looking to the future, it's useful to reflect on the past. And on this slide, you see six decades of world roundwood production. And there are a few lessons you can learn from this. First, it has steadily increased in the last decades, but actually not that much, uh, especially rather moderated increase if you compare, for example, the last 30 years when the world economy has more than doubled and we have 45% more people living in the earth. Yet the world round wood production or consumption has increased only 12%. The other lesson that you learn from this figure is that the world total round wood is composed of two almost equal size of components. The wood that we use for industrial purposes like constructions and packages. And the other part, which is the wood that we are using for energy purposes, mainly for heating. If tomorrow was just another yesterday and the world round wood production or consumption would increase as it has done during this century, this is what you would get. In 2050, uh, 30 years from today, we would end up about 20% more roundwood production in the world. 
what does this mean and what type of a question this would uh, uh, raise. I pick up three questions. First, whether this trend is a likely one or could it there be some other pattern in the future? Then if this trend, trend was actually taking place, would we have enough uh, wood in the world for this development? And last but not least, how could we produce more environmentally sustainable way the round wood? It seems that uh, the trend development is not necessarily taking place. First, there are some patterns that are causing the round wood demand to decrease also. One of the biggest uh, impacts is that people are using less uh, paper for uh, communication purposes, newspapers, magazines. We have already seen the word uh, communica communication paper decline and it will continue in the future. Also, some of the new uh, forest products, the bioeconomy products that are currently under development are not using round wood as such, but rather the residues and the industry side streams. Then one third big aspect is that uh, currently about half of the wood is used for energy purposes. In Africa, this is just 90% of the wood production. And clearly there are huge opportunities to increase the energy efficiency of using this. And there are also possibilities to move, for example, to solar and wind energy in many places. So the demand is not necessarily increasing like the trend would forecast. On the supply side, we have increasing intensively managed plantation forest uh, in many places, for example, in South America, which will provide brown wood uh, increasing in the future. There are some really big forest uh, countries such as Russia, where one fifth of the world forest resources are located that are not really harvesting. Yeah, it's, it's harvesting only half what, for example, European Union is currently harvesting. So there's a lot of potential there. But the really worrying thing when thinking about the future is that we are lacking systematic uh, recent studies, what is happening in the world roundwood market. So the lesson is that we need to invest in analyzing these in more detail. Jumping from the global setting, the more regional one, I take the example of Africa. Today, Africa is producing about 50% more wood than the European Union. And it has about four times bigger forest area than the European Union. Yet the European Union uh, forest products export value is 17 times bigger than it is in Africa. In EU, it is 100 billion US dollars, whereas in Africa, it's 6 billion. This seems to indicate to me that Africa has a huge potential to get more value from its forest, even without producing more wood, while at the same time advancing environmental, economic, and social sustainability. To do this, it would be crucial for Africa to develop its circular forest bioeconomy and the policies to support this. Clearly, there is a need for know-how, right technologies, new investment, forest management, and sustainability monitoring. And the social aspects are also crucial to engage the people to do this. So uh, my uh, view is that the word roundwood resources are not necessarily the bottleneck for the circular bioeconomic development. We of course need new innovative and more resource efficient use of round wood to produce bioproducts and bioenergy, which help to reduce the fossil raw materials. In the beginning of this century, the first generation biofuels were raising hope, and, and but unfortunately they caused a lot of problems uh, in terms of environmental sustainability, in terms of food prices. So in the future, the lesson we learn here is that we really need to impose and monitor the environmental sustainability 
and we should not compromise biodiversity or the forest carbon sink. I think there are a lot of opportunities to build synergies with the circular bioeconomy and biodiversity, for example. The most immediate need is to reduce unnecessary consumption. For example, in Europe, where I come, I wonder, do we really need these Black Fridays every November to have these consumer parties? Could we live without them? And my final thoughts, I don't think we are able to reach Paris Climate Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals without circular fire economy being part of that. Thank you, and back to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Larry, for a very clear um, summary of where we stand on the on the the information that we have about possible future trends in terms of supply. So some really kind of interesting points there that I picked up, which is this is feasible, but the system is very complex and the dynamics on supply and demand sides are changing. A huge potential in Africa with uh, know-how and tech applied and social change. The overriding imperative to uh, reduce consumption. And also, um, that we won't meet the sustainable development goals unless we address this. So uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to move now with a, to uh, to the minister. Minister, welcome, and it's uh, really a great privilege to be meeting you here today. Greetings from Scotland to Rwanda. Um, so what I would like to ask you is, in the context of sub-Saharan Africa, people depend on wood for their energy needs, including as cooking fuel. So with a circular bioeconomy there, what would you like to see change and what would you like to keep the same? Thank you very much, uh, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Kigali. I'm pleased to join this conversation. Of course, what I would like to, to talk about uh, is, is uh, Will there be enough wood for firewood for other activities than timber? Let me first start thanking the organizers for inviting us to this meeting that is discussing the crucial uh, uh, subject on nature. Of course, in Rwanda, natural resource, specifically forests, uh, use the philosophy of avoiding unnecessary generation of waste to the environment. We believe that this is where bioeconomy should start. We have in Rwanda, we stick to the principle of no waste is wasted. Rwanda promotes forest plantation, currently, uh, we have 30.4% 30 of the country's surface covered by forest. And our target was 30 by 20. So we, we had a target of covering at least 30% of our country by forest by 2020. This shows that bioeconomy concepts have a clear foundation in Rwanda. And the regulation of forest harvesting and allowing to harvest mature forest is the one of the strategies to avail enough wood without degrading the environment. The generation of different products from forest by taking into consideration cycle bioeconomy aspect is one of the strategies to overcome the global issue of climate change. Wanda believes that working with private operators in the whole forest management chain through private forest management units encourages investment in import substitution industries and creates technology transfer jobs, green jobs, I mean, and homegrown solutions toward sacro 
bioeconomy development. With the conservation efforts, Rwanda has set a target to increase our forest cover over years. So it is also worth noting that the aforementioned role of population is complemented by agroforestry plantation. Dear panelists, deforestation and land degradation continue to be the most pressing global issues of our nature. As my predecessor just said, we are seeing that Africa is being, is being deforested day by day, year by year. And Africa, of course, is becoming the highest trend. Human activities are main factors. Use of biomass as a source of uh, cooking energy and the main cause of these issues. Therefore, we should use wood for energy generation, but not as a firewood for cooking or to fire boilers in, in factories, tea factories, and in some manufacturing industries. By concluding, Rwanda believes that promoting other source of energy for cooking or to fire boilers for tea factories or other industries is the best approach to protect forests in Africa towards sacro bioeconomy and climate resilience. And we must take necessary action and we must take those actions now. We have good policies, we have good roles, we have the right institutions to monitor the reforestation of Africa. What we need is to take action. So we have to work together and let us work together, hands in hands, for the purpose of availing wood through forest landscape restoration for sustainable environment protection. As COVID-19, even the climate change due to deforestation of Africa or other continents, they don't need passport. They don't need visa to affect other continent. So let us work together to finance different initiatives, different projects to change the way we do business to promote other source of energy for cooking rather than biomass. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Minister. That was, that was really, really good and covering so many things. Um, I love that phrase, no waste is worth it. I think that's great. That really um, captures things. And you, and you, you reference the forest cover, but it's also, it's not just plantations, it's protect the natural forest and agroforestry and how all of these things work together um, is, is how the solution comes together. Um, and then the discussion about firewood and, and finding other more carbon efficient sources of fuel to, to reduce that pressure that's coming from firewood so that that wood can be used in higher value end products. I think that's a really important point. And then finally, your point about we must, this is all link, interconnected. This is a global issue that plays out differently in different territories and the need for that interconnection. So um, thank you very much for, for that comment. I've got loads of questions coming in, so we'll probably come back to you with some questions in a minute. Um, so you. I'm going to move uh, move now to uh, Pina, if uh, I could introduce you. So uh, Pina from FSC. Um, so I'm going to ask um, a couple of questions now to you from an FSC perspective. And I think you're joining us from Peru, is that right? Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm based in Lima, Peru. Yes. Great. OK, so um, to start off with, how do you see competing demands for wood, especially for bioenergy, being resolved in the coming years? And probably following on from that, what are the scenarios for adding forest land, restoring forest 
to ensure that there will be enough wood? Is there anything that the rest of us can learn from Latin America? Thanks. Well, the use of woody biomass for energy takes place in a very complex framework where the forest-based sector plays a crucial role in response to the changes in bioenergy demand. These responses are linked to critical aspects such as the land use, forest management practices, industrial processes, and consumption patterns, which at the same time imposes social, environmental, and economic challenges. In FSC, we recognize bioenergy as a key component in circular bioeconomy. However, circular bioeconomy should be approached with an integrated vision that connects responsible management and use of natural capital with responsible production and consumption. There needs to be a shift in industrial processes, in particular in the global south, to consider product life cycle beyond recycling and remanufacturing. And there's also a big need of a collective effort to change consumer behaviors. See, we are closing with industry sectors that are advancing the circular bioeconomy agenda. For example, the wood-based fiber industry for sustainable textiles. In 2016, the global production of textile fibers was 93 million tons, and it's projected that in 2050, this will increase to 250 million tons. Another sector that we believe can advance the bioeconomy, the circular bioeconomy agenda, is the wood construction sector. As you know, for each tone of wood products used instead of concrete, there could be an emission reduction of two tons of CO2. And assuming 100% market share of wood building mass, this can imply a 3.5% decrease or reduction of total European Union CO2 emissions. Considering the global trends on timber demand uh, that Lori presented very well in the, in the introduction um, speech, uh, there is a shift, a trend to a shift to engineered and reconstituted wood products. And this, of course, will have an implication, a land use implication. If we talk about the three main forest related activities that can ensure the provision of uh, forest related products and ecosystem services, these are mainly three the use of natural and protected ecosystems for, for ecosystem services delivery, creating new ecosystems through restoration, and sustainable forest management. FSC certification on sustainable forest management covers now around 25% of the global wood supply. However, we haven't been able to change the disturbing deforestation figure of 30 million hectares of forest lost annually, especially in the global south and tropical forests. To face the increase in timber demand, political, financial, and corporate decisions should strive to maximize synergies between the different land uses, including conservation, restoration, sustainable forest management, agroforestry, and also minimize the trade-offs between the products and the provision of ecosystem services that should be able to provide local uh, benefits and incomes to communities. I also believe that product diversification with high potential, such as bamboo that was mentioned before, non-timber forest products, and the provision of ecosystem services, including carbon sequestration, can be tangible solutions for the Global South. In 2018, FSC launched a new procedure, which was the ecosystem services procedure, to expand the scope of FSC certification to verify positive impacts on ecosystem services. In Latin America, for example, one of the first implementers is a cooperative uh, of smallholders called Alpa Bamboo. This cooperative is now selling FSC certified bamboo products with verified positive impacts on water conservation. And there are several other examples on this. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Apina. Um, I think these these comments about about bamboo. I think that's a that's a really interesting in the context of the global south and the role of bamboo in this bioeconomy um, is re is really significant. And um, having FSC working through some of the the implications of that, I think, is building on what you've learnt is um, is really valuable. Um, it's uh, it's it's disappointing, but maybe not entirely surprising that the uh, in spite of everything, all of the amazing work that FSC has done, 
and how much it has transformed things that we are still seeing deg forest degradation and, and that hasn't stopped. Uh, but I suppose what I would say is just think how bad it might have been if FSC and others hadn't managed to do that. So, um, so yeah, but it, it, we can't keep on doing it going right back to what Prince Charles said at the start. So, uh, so thank you very much for that. We'll come back with some, um, I've got this huge list of questions from the, from the audience. So hopefully we'll come back to you with some of those um, just at the end. I'm gonna move now to uh, Michael Allen Brady. Um, welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, I think, are you there? Yeah. Yes, you're there, that's great. So Michael joins us from C4. Um, so, so, so nice to see you, Michael. Um, a couple of questions for you. First of all, circular bioeconomy approach would include new types of global value chains that involve forest resources. So how would a circular bioeconomy style value chain be different than business as usual? So how will things change if we're successful in getting this circular bioeconomy value chain? And then particularly with your perspective from Southeast Asia, with millions of people moving from rural to urban areas, how are their needs being considered in the circular bioeconomy and will there be enough wood for them? Okay, well, thank you, Jill. Uh, I'll talk about uh, value chains first. Uh, I'd like to build on Laurie's example of Africa uh, needing to develop its circular bioeconomy to get more value from its forests. As he explained, this will involve increased know-how, right technologies, uh, new investments. I'll provide a little bit more detail on forest resources and examples of value added in a circular bioeconomy. So I think as we all know, the dominant forest resource is timber and timber uses can be split into three broad categories, construction, uh, wood products, biomass for energy and the paper and packaging industry. Sawn wood or lumber from saw logs is the highest unit value in growing timber and is consumed largely by the construction industry. There are many other forest resources, uh, as mentioned by PINA, uh, NTFP, environmental services such as carbon, water, air, but let's focus on timber. A first type of value added is just generally more efficient use of wood based on value for lumber, wood products, and fuel and wood residues for energy. So to add value, uh, do not use expensive lumber for biomass fuel. A second uh, form of value add is using lumber more efficiently for wood products. And this is typically done through improved sawmilling technologies and the use of smaller round wood. Uh, just go to your nearest Ikea uh, outlet to see how small the, the round wood is in, in their products. It's quite amazing. Another value add is using lumber uh, for new and different use products, uh, such as for higher value products, including new materials, such as cross laminated timber, blue laminated beams, uh, and even prefabricated buildings can be included here. Finally, uh, wood can be used to substitute other building materials such as steel and concrete, and even combined and composite materials such as plastics. Timber frame skyscrapers and buildings are just, just coming to the market and are expected to replace heavier metals and concrete. Uh, an interesting and more recent example of value added is the use uh, in my country, Canada, of residue wood fiber in masks for uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So as Laurie concluded, there are many opportunities in a circular bioeconomy to add more value to using forest resources uh, that I've not mentioned, uh, such as conservation and management offsets for emissions reduction, and even green investments by timber investment management organizations. Uh, these provide diversified income and capitalize on biological growth element of forests. All of these examples will require increased know-how, the right technologies and new investments. And where forest resources are limited, good forest management, sustainability monitoring are required to ensure adequate supplies. Uh, the question uh, on Southeast Asia, uh, I would say that 
there are at least three pressures on wood resources that are occurring in Southeast Asia, and for that matter, elsewhere around the globe. These include urbanization, decarbonization, and increased building. On urbanization, as, as you mentioned, Joan, uh, we see global urban population is forecasted to rise by 53% over the next 30 years. This is driven by both population growth and the move from rural to urban areas to seek prosperity, better jobs, better health, uh, better access to education and whatnot. Urbanization and rising GDP per capita uh, both increase timber demand. For example, growth in the production of paper, paperboard, since the last recession has taken place almost entirely uh, in the Southeast Asia region. On decarbonization, globally, the majority of countries have set significant targets to reduce carbon emissions towards a net zero by 2050. Timber will play a critical role in this transformation Timber is the natural and sustainable low carbon substitute product in building and baseload energy that we've talked about earlier. Uh, more building will occur as a result of population increases and urbanization, it's certainly happening in Southeast Asia. House building, independent of the additional uses of timber, continues to underpin timber consumption, and this applies to Southeast Asia as well. As an example, wood-based panels such as veneer, plywood, particle board, uh, fiber board, they've all seen a strong increase in production in recent years, mainly due to the growth in uh, the Asia Pacific region, although this is dominated by uh, China. The increase in urban dwellers is concentrated in regions such as Southeast Asia, where there are insufficient resources of mature timber. Consumers here are driving increased demand on the fixed traditional sources of wood supply. So it, it is an issue in Southeast Asia. As a result, forecasts indicate an almost threefold increase in timber consumption over the next 30 years in this region. And this, this goes from about 2 billion cubic meters consumed today to about 6 billion in 2050. So as Laurie showed, there is a finite supply of timber. The vast majority of global commercial timber supply is sourced from temperate forests in the Northern Hemisphere and plantations in Oceania where climates permit the growing of softwood timber. However, uh, growth in the production of paper and paperboard since the recession has taken place almost entirely in the Asia Pacific region. So what does the future look like? Timber consumption is forecast to increase by about 3% per annum over the next 30 years to 2050. This is up from about 1% over the last 20 years that, uh, that Laurie presented. Timber consumption is therefore expected to overtake realistic sustainable supply. Moreover, the move into a more inaccessible, harder to reach timber supplies will likely drive up the cost of timber extraction and supporting uh, increased global uh, increase in timber prices. So Southeast Asia and much of the rest of the world are set to change significantly in the next 30 years. Urbanization and economic decarbonization occurring at the same time are forecast to be among the key megatrends between now and 2050. Wood is at the heart of both, on a positive note, according to the most recent forest resource assessment in 2020, the area of forest under management plans is increasing in all regions, including Southeast Asia, and put a plug in for FSC. So th thank you for that, Joe. Thanks very much, Michael. That's um, it's a kind of interesting counterpoint to the very zoomed out um, global perspective we got from Larry and then seeing how that's then playing out in the different regions um, where maybe the global picture might look like you could get supply and demand in balance. But when you start coming down to the regional levels, um, 
there appears to be more tension and more issues arising there. And then bringing in the, the, the really significant importance of um, things like FSC, uh, global govern uh, not global sort of governance and monitoring of supply chains. Um, and, and the need for technology and good governance there to, to, to get into that. Um, and this, this issue of increasing urbanization, interested in your sort of your reference to offsite construction. Um, I know it's, it's something that we're looking at in the North as well in terms of reducing waste. So you can do offsite construction and then more of that wood goes into your end product, less of it goes into sawdust or into biomass for fuel. So, um, Really interesting. And then also, I think, although you focused on lumber, this this issue of uh, non timber forest products and developing markets for those and trying to drive that value back to the forest. So we get those markets working. Um, so great. That's that's really good. Thank you uh, for those three uh, panelists. Um, I'm now going to come back to uh, the to the minister. Um, Hopefully she's had time to uh, catch breath after her earlier intervention. So, uh, so, so Minister, um, I'm going to come back to you now in terms of what you, what you said at the start about um, the, the things that you wanted to see happen. I just wondered, um, given what you've heard and this conversation about the transition to a circular bioeconomy, what is happening in Rwanda um, currently? And what would you like to see happening? What needs to change, say, maybe over the next five years? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Of course, as I said, what is happening in Rwanda, uh, we still have a long way to go, but we are coming far. We are somewhere, but we still have a long vision to attain in environment protection. For example, on cycle bioeconomy, what we are doing, we are making sure that the management of forest is done from the from the from the community and by the community. Communities have their own private forest, and those forests we help the community. To, to, to put together what they have and to consolidate the forest, the small or the forest that they are having and consolidate them into a forest unit that they will manage and protect. And of course, with the time produce timber, timber and not uh, biomass for cooking. They will produce timber and the timber will go on in, into market to promote the made in Rwanda product. But the, 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 the sawmill that they are, they are having by producing timber, they fabricate briquettes, ferrets for, for replacing the firewood. So those pellets are then used instead of using uh, timber. Uh, I mean, instead of using biomass for cooking. And of course, it becomes a cycle. As I said, no waste is wasted. Not only the sawmill has produced the pellets, but we have timber. At the same time, we are preparing a nursery for the next tree planting season. And the population is economically growing and they are the one who are now protecting the forest. And on the, on the other side, the branches of the trees are used to, to, to feed, for example, cows. Because you know, uh, Rwanda is, is a country of cows and uh, we, we do treat them as part of our families. And if you use those branches, leaves for, for feeding cows, cows are going to give cow dung 
from cow dungs, we produce biogas. And from, by using biogas, we are reducing the use of firewood. It becomes a cycle. That is how we are doing in Rwanda. And of course, when I'm saying that no waste is wasted, even the waste from our, our, our kitchen is used to produce fertilizers. That way we are reducing the money or the budget spent on buying industrial fertilizers we use from our kitchens and in each uh, in each household there is a promotion of having kitchen garden for each household so that the fertilizer we are making from our kitchens are used to maintain our kitchen gardens and we are producing uh, greens that we are using in our kitchen. It becomes a cycle and families are trying, all families, even the city, even the capital city, we have even, we are planting greens even in sacks. Nobody can say, no, I have small land, I can't grow greens, I can't grow vegetables. We use sacks and you can place that sack everywhere in the corner of our household. That is how we do cycle economy. And I think if every household in Rwanda will do the same, we will, we will uh, promote and we will be economically viable and we will increase our economy. I thank you. That's great. Thank you. I don't, I don't think we could have asked for a better a kind of um, story of how circular bioeconomy works at a human scale. You know, we've been talking very globally and I, th I think, you know, you really brought that, that into the, the kind of the, the community and the human level. So that was a wonderful example with the, the, the lumber, the, the timber, going back from Mark's point, going for the high value end, you use the waste from that. You use that for your energy, then you use the 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 waste from the energy to fertilize your crops. Uh, you know that's just that's just really beautifully captured. So lessons for us all from Rwanda there. Great. Um, okay. So uh, thank you very much. We now have a question from the audience, um, and this is um, a, a first for this afternoon. We've got a video question coming in from Laura, who I think is in Kenya. Um, so I'm hoping now we're going to get a video question displayed if the technical people. I'm Laura, based in Nairobi, Kenya, and my question for the panel is about the factors that need to be considered before the implementation of forest-based solutions for a transition to a circular bioeconomy. So I'm curious to know, based on the evidence that's emerging, what are some of those critical factors or conditions that need to be in place for forest-based solutions to work? What stakeholders have to buy in to such initiatives? What incentives are required for each of those stakeholders to participate? What kind of skills and knowledge do they need to possess? And lastly, what kind of policy environment is required? Thank you. very much Laura so uh, she's asking what critical factors need to be in place for this transition um, and that's relating to stakeholders incentives skills and policies so um, who would like to would any of my panelists uh, like to put their hand up to answer this or will I just pick one of you Okay, uh, in which case, Pina, I'm going to come to you first then, um, because it's about governance and maybe you could kick us off. Yes, uh, one of the lessons learned in FSC about the implementation of nature-based solutions and our engagement now uh, in many platforms connected to restoration, conservation, is that there's still a lack of proper investment on nature-based solutions and that most of the investments are always connected to a highly productive value chain. 
So it's really difficult to escalate community or local based projects to an extent that are attractive to investors. So that's one of the factors that I think are crucial. The other one, of course, is the political decision uh, on supporting uh, national and local uh, projects and programs connected to nature-based solutions. And that relates also to the governance factor that it's quite relevant as well. In FSC, we have the experience of connecting stakeholders of different kinds and, and local communities and indigenous peoples, but there's still uh, a fragmented view on governance at the land level sector. So we need a proper integration of landscape level governance and better integration of all local actors uh, to, to advance nature-based solutions. So I will stay there. Thanks very much, Pina. Michael, you wanted to come in. Yeah, maybe maybe just building on what Pina has just uh, mentioned. I, I guess I come from a uh, an economic enterprise perspective, where you know if uh, if timber uh, and forest resources are you know to be used beyond subsistence, you know where there's some kind of trade, then uh, clearly. Uh, prerequisites like markets, uh, enterprise, uh, demand, uh, Pina mentioned finance. These, these are all prerequisites that, that really have to be in place. And there's uh, a lot of capacity building needed in, you know, in all of these areas. Uh, but again, it, just to emphasize, this is if we're looking at, at a commercial, um, you know, commercial um, world beyond beyond subsistence. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Minister, I don't know if, if you could um, bring anything in on this when you spoke earlier about these community driven projects, we are actually generating um, a kind of cash cash crop lumber product as well as a more subsistence thing. Um, I, I don't know if you could reflect a bit on how those markets have developed along the lines that Michael was talking about. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. First of all, as you know, we, when we are talking about the coverage of forest in Rwanda, all the forests are not, uh, are not government forests. The biggest part of those forests are privately owned by the community. So that's why we grouped them into private forest management units. And nearby those forests, we have water harvesting channels. And when it rains, we collect that, that water to, to irrigate those forests. And those are the population themselves who are doing that. And when, when we, we have those channels to collect water, at the same time, we are, we are protecting our land against soil erosion. And with those private forest management units, populations create jobs for God who will guard the forest against every cutting of trees and of course the, there are they are forming cooperatives and those cooperatives now are the ones who are producing cook stoves cook stoves that will help them not only to to use less biomass but to use the pellets they produce from the sawmill. And those cook stoves are not sold only in the locality. They sell those cook stoves to other communities. So you can understand when you involve community into implementation of policy, you yeah. become successful. Because it is not the government that will go into implementation. It is the community that do implementation because they know the value of the imp well implemented policy and it works in Rwanda. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and squeeze in just one more question from from the audience. And um, if you could all use if you could use the raise hand, if any of you are wanting to uh, able to answer it as briefly as you can. So and this is a question from Marlon. I don't know what country uh, Marlon is in, but Marlon asks, what is the main potential solution to prove the efficiency of wood production? So go, Michael. I think efficiency can be defined many ways. Uh, you can have efficiency around the growing environment. So obviously wood production in the tropics is going to be at much higher rates than in the, in the boreal. Um, efficiency can be uh, technology related. So um, you know, more efficient. Uh, extraction, transport uh, systems. Uh, efficiency can be also related to forest management um, where you can have um, improved um, forest conditions uh, if, if um, you know, management is, is done appropriately. Um, so I think efficiency has many, many uh, aspects. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks. And, and, and on that, I, I'm gosh, we could have probably had a whole session just talking about efficiency through forest supply chains, if I'm entirely honest. So uh, well done for trying to answer that. Apina, do you want to quickly come in? I've only got a minute left. So do you want to come yeah. in? Well, I, I mentioned before the need of a shift in industrial processes connected to timber production and wood Hello. based production. Um, so I think that's one of the key Hello. elements that means how we work. can use technology uh, 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 as well, but also the consideration of life cycle of products and the consideration, of course, of carbon impacts in, in, in supply chains. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Pina. And, and thank you, um, uh, panel. That was great. It was a really good discussion and I'm hoping that we've kept plenty of audience with us so um, I'm going to close this pa this session now and hand back to Sonia so thank you very much everybody for your participation Sonia over to you yes thank you very much Joe and also thank you to the panelists for the very insightful sessions that highlighting the importance of wood timber industry and forest management in the transition into circular bioeconomy Again, thank you very much for engaging with us with your questions on Zoom and Facebook. Please keep raising your questions. And we will now take a five minute break before we, we have our next sessions. And after five minutes, we will start the next sessions that will look at the innovative applications of the circular bioeconomy in actions. So thank stay you. with us and see you in five minutes. Forests for sustainable cities. Urban areas are home to more than half the world's population. They drive the global economy, but are responsible for more than two thirds of the world's energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Their importance continues to grow. By 2050, we expect that two thirds of the global population will live in cities. As the world continues to urbanize, cities need to play a leading role in fighting climate change. They also need to deal with challenges linked to their residents' increasing demands for water, food, energy and materials. For example, the increase in population means more new homes, schools and other buildings. We have not yet built 50% of the urban fabric, which will be required globally by 2050. But the construction sector is currently dominated by materials like concrete and steel, whose production is not environmentally friendly. 
If we want to tackle climate change and other urgent environmental problems, we need to change our approach. How can our forests help to build sustainable cities and make them climate smart? Our forests provide wood, which is the only significant construction material that is renewable and can be grown sustainably. Using wood in construction is one of the most effective carbon sequestration and capture technologies we have. If we replace concrete and steel with wood, we can reduce the carbon footprint of a building by around 50%. Another way to improve the sustainability of our cities is to plant trees and urban forests. Trees can cool cities by between 2 and 8 centigrade. If you plant trees near buildings, it can cut air conditioning use by 30% and reduce heating energy use by 20 to 50%. Urban forests clean the air, reduce flood risk and offer health benefits like lowering stress. Forests outside urban areas are important too. One third of the world's largest cities get a significant proportion of their drinking water from forested areas. Wood, trees and forests are the backbone for sustainable cities. At the European Forest Institute, we connect knowledge to action.
means from theory to practice, the circular bioeconomy in actions. And our moderator now is Mary Jenga, a research scientist with C4, C4E Craft and an expert on bioenergy. She works on natural resource management in urban and rural settings, as well as adaptive technology development and transfer. And I remind you again, don't forget to put any questions you have uh, for the panelists in the Q&A box. And now I invite Mary. Mary, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to our session on From Theory to Practice the Circular Bioeconomy in Action. Uh, in this session, we are looking really forward to very practical experiences from uh, different parts of the world. We have a very good uh, team of panelists, and uh, these four panelists include Vincente, who is an architect, Rocio involved in research, Nicholas in forest-based Sakura bioeconomy businesses, and Isabella involved in uh, policy. And the way we will conduct this session is that I will pose two questions to every panelist, and then they will talk to those questions based on their experiences. And I will start now with uh, Kisente. The question is, millions of people are moving from rural to urban areas and their energy and housing needs will be massive. What kinds of wood-based uh, solutions do you see as most promising? I want to put to you the second question, which is related to that, and you can talk to both. What suggestions do you have for scaling up the sustainable use of wood and creating more sustainable cities. Over to you, Vicente, tell us. Okay, so thank you very much for, for the invitation and thank you very much for the questions. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, many times we say that by 2050, we'll be uh, around 70% of population in urban areas. But if we make the numbers, we'll see that in the next 30 years, we need to urbanize around 1 billion people. And this means to be building a city of around 4 million people every month in the next 30 years. So this is a huge process of urbanization. And what is important to understand is that if we follow using the same approach as we did during the 20th century, we'll destroy the planet. So we are in the process of destroying the planet, but then even in this next 30 years, we'll be, we'll be able to accelerate the process that we are doing about uh, urbanization. So from that point of view, I think that, uh, well, there are some parts of the world, especially I would say America and Europe, that cities are already built and we need to do a lot of retrofitting. But there are many places like in Africa, some places in Asia and in Latin America, where many new areas need to be urbanized. And the first message is that we should not, we should learn from the mistakes of, uh, of, the, of the past. We should learn from the mistakes of what we did during the 20th century. And then it's important during many time, you know, ecology was something that was used an argument in order to uh, make a balance with the process of destruction we are doing developing the uh, fuel uh, and the oil economy but right now we don't have time anymore to do this so that means that we need to develop a new forms of economy that are directly ecological 
So that means that in some places in Africa and in, uh, and in India, for example, that you have an incredible knowledge as we saw in the previous sessions about how to deal with the forest. The important thing is try to avoid uh, to, to make another 20th century in Africa that you will be somehow destroyed to re your resources in order to try to save it later. So somehow you, you, the important thing, and this is something we are working also with the European Forest Institute, is develop the new principle for the bio cities. You know, every 50 years, we change the model of how we make cities. We did 100 years ago with the modern, the so-called modern city and the Bauhaus, a school that was created in, in Europe. And we have another big change in the, in the 70s, uh, 50 years ago. Right now, we, after these global pandemics and also in front of this global warming uh, problem, the question is we need to reinvent how we make cities and not to use nature as a kind of way to, uh, to soften the process that we do when we build with concrete. We should go directly to invent the way we make cities and the principle for biocities is that biocities are the cities that follows the principles of natural systems in order to promote life. So it's not that we use trees, we plant trees near the buildings, is that we follow the rules of the nature, the rules of the forest in order to imagine how we should make cities. So if forests absorb CO2, why we make cities that make that emit CO2. If in the part, in forest the animals uh, are not moving too much in order to look for food, why we live in cities that we are all day moving, trying to go from, uh, from uh, working areas to our living areas? So I would say that uh, the cities are the solution, but we need to do a new generation of cities. And connected with the second question that you were mentioning about the sustainable management of wood, I think that uh, also as the minister was saying in the previous speech, this must be done by the community. You know, the, the process of making cities should emerge from the community. That's why we are developing projects also in Africa, uh, developing the, the construction of plants to manage the wood. For example, these cross laminated uh, timber, the CLT plants, in order that the CLT plant is a fundamental part of the urban development. We should avoid to take the wood from Africa to send maybe to China to do a panel somewhere in Europe and send it back to China, uh, send it back to Africa, because you have already the, the raw material in Africa. And then the question is, that these new cities that, well, the same in Indonesia, that is a country with a lot of uh, timber, that we need to develop a model where every city includes the facilities to build itself. Uh, the facilities where people are learning about how to manage the forest, about how to produce energy, about how to produce food in order that this circular economy are applied to the scale of the cities. And this is really a very, first of all, is very strong revolution, but in the second uh, hand, is something very realistic. You know, what is unrealistic is that we destroy the forest and we make our buildings uh, with uh, concrete. This is unrealistic. And this doesn't make sense in any way. So that means that to learn how to empower the communities, to create economy for, to empower the local uh, people in, in Asia, in Africa and Latin America, this is a fundamental challenge for the years to come. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that's a good uh, a perspective of sustainable cities you know, from an uh, uh, ecological perspective. Let's build using nature. Uh, thank you so much. Rocio, you are in research and uh, tell us, what do you see as the biggest challenge 
in the circular bioeconomy transition. When it comes to energy and the demand for it and the related themes. That's the first question. The second question, what is different about the Eastern African bioeconomy strategy compared to ones from the global north? Rocio? Thank you, Mary. Um, and uh, thanks for the, uh, to Sifor for the invitation to, to this conference. Thank you also for, for the questions, Mary. I think the first part is uh, uh, regarding the, the challenges in energy is really to understand the differences on uh, when it comes in particular to bioenergy. When we are talking about bioeconomy, we are talking or referring uh, more specifically to bioenergy. So we know and we heard it also from uh, the previous sessions about the differences between the forests in temperate areas and forests in tropical areas or semi-tropical. So how we use, how we utilize these resources, particularly for bioenergy, it's going to make a difference on, where, on location, where, where you are, how they are uh, uh, utilized. But we have also to remember that there is a, a, a biomass trade and it has increased in the, in the last years. The International Energy Agency has a task dedicated to that, but also has uh, uh, shifted into sustainability of this biomass trade. We, we know that there is a trade of pellets, for example, from United States to, to Europe for energy power, for energy generation. But it is different in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. And we heard already uh, several explanations about how uh, the importance of fuel, fuel wood and the importance of, of charcoal production and how this may affect some of the areas, some, some, of, the, some of the forests, where the advent, advantages of having natural forests where uh, people can rely on other type of, of benefits and, and products. So I would say that in terms of the challenges for energy is really how this uh, bioenergy can be related to, for example, the use of residues and how they can be utilized in a different way for agro-industries uh, with forest residues, with agricultural residues, but also with other type of, of, of uh, methods like cogeneration. We know that in the case of Uganda, uh, uh, the utilization of biogas for, uh, of, sorry, of uh, sugarcane bagasse for, for the cogeneration of energy is, is in use. There are other countries, uh, South Africa, for example, using it. And of course, Brazil is, is another one that has put the example for these uh, uh, alternatives. So I think that the way part, uh, we have to look at how they are uh, utilized in each region, the case of Asia, for example, with palm oil and how it can be uh, used for uh, production of liquid biofuels. But uh, we have to remember that some of the aspects of energy access are related to how uh, they are conceived uh, according to the SDG. So there is much emphasis on electrification, access to electricity. But we need to remember that Sub-Saharan Africa has a big problem when it comes to uh, the cooking sector and how this uh, is sorted out for the population uh, that is different from rural, urban, and peri-urban areas. So, how we reconcile the use of all these different type of fuels, let's say, or these other alternatives for the local populations, it's one of the main aspects to consider for energy access. Now, regarding your second question about um, what is uh, the difference about the bioeconomy in the global north compared to the global south, well, this is going to be a little bit more tricky. Bi bioeconomy and circular bioeconomy and their circularity should be implicit in bioeconomy because bioeconomy has come out particularly from Europe, uh, United States, Canada, uh, with the strategies they already have focusing on how to reduce the use of, of fossil fuels, not just for energy, but also for products. How can we substitute many of the products that have been produce uh, through the fossil fuel industry. So in the case of um, all the Global South, many, many uh, regions have already started to look at these possibilities. We have been collaborating with the BioInnovate, ISTECO, 
um, Sinovate, ATPS, and Bioinnovations with the Stockholm Environment Institute. And we have developed the first East Africa bioeconomy strategy. This, uh, we had the first event last year, and we focus on four thematic areas. One is on food and uh, agriculture and forestry. Another one is based on health. Another one is on bio uh, products. And the last one is on, on uh, energy. So how these uh, different countries in East Africa are going to adopt this bio strategy domestics. for their national strategies is one of the important aspects for uh, the region. So the, just to, to finalize this point is bioeconomy also has different meanings on where, uh, depending on which region you are. But in particular for Sub-Saharan Africa, we can focus on supply chains that are improved. This, this does not necessarily need to have high logistics or high investments, and that can be done at a later stage. But it was mentioned also in, in some of the previous um, uh, presentations. There, there is a vast number of resources in Sub-Saharan Africa that can be utilized in a different way and improve it for sustainable uh, value chains, but also for uh, a proper bio-trade market in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rocio. Uh, that's good that uh, you're bringing the whole idea of um, bioenergy and the related residues and how cooking uh, energy, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa relates to the SDG uh, and so on. Now, I want to go to Nicholas. Nicholas, what are the most promising wood-based innovations you are seeing today? What else would you like to see? Where are the finance related bottlenecks when talking about bringing forest based innovations to the market? Nicholas. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thanks also for uh, inviting me to this event and inviting Finland uh, to this event. Uh, I hope you can see the background picture, which is a typical Finnish forest uh, in winter time. Uh, so if I look outside the window, it looks like like that. But this is this is fake, or this is a photograph. Um, so greetings from Finland. Um, so Mary, your questions. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, most promising. Uh, uh, I think you you need to. Uh, take into account that, that uh, we have the three pillars of sustainability. Uh, so, so when you talk about the most promising innovation, then you have to have a, a, a nice balance between all three pillars, not only look at the economics. Uh, but having said that, uh, in terms of uh, the short, short term, uh, I would uh, claim that uh, the conventional businesses are still uh, uh, quite interesting and, and uh, uh, include a lot of uh, uh, potential for the future. And if I just take uh, two examples of the conventional uh, businesses first, uh, uh, first of all, uh, packaging uh, sector is uh, developing very fast and, and this pandemic has, has really accelerated that. Uh, so wood-based packaging, which is a conventional product, uh, for instance, board, uh, I think that will uh, see great innovations in the future as well. Uh, the second thing I have as, as an example of the conventional uh, businesses uh, relates to what Vincente was already uh, talking about, building with wood. And when, when I say building with wood, that is, is, is of course um, um, a mix of different raw materials, but, but increasing the amount of uh, wood-based solutions and, and having innovations in that field, I think is important. In terms of uh, the longer term, uh, uh, I would uh, say that, or I typically put forward two areas. Uh, first one is replacing plastics. Uh, and obviously we cannot replace all the plastics, the fossil plastics, but, but uh, we, we can uh, have great innovations uh, uh, with wood in that uh, space. 
and you have uh, more or less two ways of uh, uh, of uh, entering this market either you make uh, from the wood based material directly the plastic like product or then you make uh, a chemical which is then later on uh, uh, turned uh, processed into a, a plastic like uh, product uh, the second example or se second area which I, I i think is promising uh, relates partly to to the first one but that's textile fiber fibers so the 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 market for textile fibers is huge uh, and uh, there is uh, a lot of room uh, for, for growing the share of wood-based textile fibers and there is a huge demand for more sustainable uh, raw materials. So those uh, areas I, I think uh, are most promising. In terms of the finance uh, related bottlenecks uh, in, in this uh, uh, scope, uh, if I only think about the long term uh, uh, to keep my answer short, uh, I think, uh, and also if I focus on, on uh, such business ideas where you are manufacturing a physical product, obviously we also have these digital tools and services which you can uh, provide, but I talk about now a, a physical product and the manufacturing of, of that. So typically you go from lab to pilot to demo, and then you have a first uh, uh, commercial factory. Uh, uh, and this is quite expensive because uh, you need a lot of financing uh, uh, to cover uh, these different plants, uh, especially the demo plants can be very expensive uh, and, and not a profitable uh, unit. So, so you need to cover the capi capital expenditure uh, related to that. And it's not so easy to, to, to find uh, financing for, for that kind of activity. So that is really a, a bottleneck for, for, for why we, or for uh, why we are not uh, bringing forest-based innovations faster to the market. And also, one needs to remember that if we are uh, if we are focusing on bulk uh, products, uh, then uh, the customers that you are trying to get they 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 tend to to keep a low profile as long as there is only one supplier of that market uh, that product. Sorry. So uh, if you really protect your idea with patents and stuff, uh, uh, it will not really uh, develop fast uh, because the, the, the customers expect uh, for many reasons that there are many suppliers for the same product. So this in brief, thank you. Over to you, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for giving us that perspective from the business and what bottlenecks exist. Isabella, a circular bioeconomy is premised on achieving climate change mitigation goals. What does the Amazon experience tell us? That's the first question. The second one, what are some examples you've seen of successful circular bioeconomy type approaches at the sub-national level. Why do yes, they work? Yeah. Tell Thank us. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, good morning from Brazil. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to join you, our friends in this panel, uh, to discuss uh, indeed how to act, okay? And uh, in Brazil, we have this, uh, sensitive situation considering there's some setbacks related to Amazonia, uh, Amazon uh, deforestation, technical deforestation, but also it's very important that to, you can uh, make clear what are the challenges that we have today, not only to go against deforestation, but also how we go into the future, consider sustainable management and also innovative approach for the forest protection and Brazil development. Uh, it's very important. Sometimes people, everybody likes to, to discuss Amazonia, but uh, the numbers are so impressive. Uh, Amazonia in Brazil means six, more than 6% of a national territory. Okay, we're discussing more than 5 million of square kilometers. We are looking forward to address 17% of the country's energy. Also, uh, more than 25 million people live there, and Vincent, 8% of these people live in cities. It's a huge challenge to address urban areas in Amazonia. 
okay? And also, we cannot forget that to have more than 20% of the planet's water in Amazonia and the lowest rates of human development index in Brazil, unfortunately, in Amazonia, are in Amazonia. And we need to tackle two different situations. No carbon, uh, uh, no economic carbon, the carbon that comes from illegal deforestation, and the economic carbon that comes from uh, the economic activities that you need to promote transition, looking for for low carbon economies or the new green economies. So for this, we need to bring society together, okay? And Brazilian society is impressed with the recent research about this and the list of numbers. It's fully engaged to go against deforestation and also to find innovative ways to protect Amazon. Also to tackle climate change, but they highlight always that you need to have inclusive national strategy for mitigation and adaptation in climate change agenda in Brazil. Why? Because you need to tackle to face social inequalities. In Amazonia, the numbers are really, the gaps among Amazonian region and other regions in Brazil are really deep ones. So what's happened today in Brazil? We, when nation, we discussed deforestation to tackle deforestation, I was, I know a lot about this because the lowest rates of deforestation in Amazon, it was tackling during my term as a minister of environment in Brazil. But we need to go there to tackle this. And unfortunately, the federal government today and uh, not necessarily well succeed with the strategy they adopt. In, in the opposite, we are raising the rates of deforestation in Amazonia. But the subnational players, the governors and the mayors and civil society, they are looking for innovative political arrangements and so society engagement, the private sector engagement to bring solutions, not only to tackle deforestation, but to go into the future, consider how we can manage and can protect the forest and how we can promote inclusive sustainable development in the Amazon region. So I like to highlight here three or two or three experiences on, because you don't have much time, but we have now a private and uh, private sector and financial sector and also civil society under the umbrella of concertation is an initiative to bring everybody together. And they are looking for uh, to understand better the, and to finance from private funds to finance innovative ways for based on soil to biodiversity development model. We're looking for a positive impact development strategy. So we named this uh, bioeconomic 4.0 industry based on innovation and conservation, a new business model. This is really a huge debate in Brazil with new arrangements looking for, with the political support from the, this consortium, this alliance of the government of states to looking for, to put in practice not only small projects, but really well-defined, well-structured building blocks for a new way to promote regional development based on green economies in Amazonia. The other side of the coin, you can have a really good example uh, from Natura. This is, every, I think that everybody knows this, but the momentum that Natura has is an important industry in Brazil based on the bioeconomy that uh, we have a new cycle of development and challenges for this company based on exactly in net zero deforestation in 2025 and also net zero, net zero emissions from carbon in 2030. This is the strategy of the company and these are coming with really high level of ambition, not only to readdress uh, what you call biocosmetic bio strategy, but also to understand better how the, uh, the role of the company to promote GDP based on the standard forest economy and the social progress index for the territories in Amazonia. Natura used to play in different territories in Amazonia, not only one state, and also they are looking for to be more efficient with natural resource management and also value supply chains. The second example also in Amazonia, you have the new, the good, the well succeed experience based on uh, uh, agroforest system. This is based on Dende, it's a palm oil uh, in the state of Pará. We exactly knowing that we need to avoid the negative impacts of the monoculture that are so well known. So you have agroforest systems now with innovation systems based on bioeconomy and mitigating climate change emissions. So then the production is based on this system today, it's really a huge project with, with good outcomes, showing that you can bring productivity, biodiversity, soil fertility, carbon stocks, and also small producers together. So the, as you call, SEA, 
as AF DNA project shows that the use of agroforestry systems in, for the production of the power meets, in the case of DNA, meets the needs of smallholders, contributes for the conserv conservation of natural resources, and promote the sustainable development of the rural population. So these are three examples. The new approach, uh, standing forests and bioproducts based on Amazonia 4.0, the echoes line from Natura that since 992, did this start, we start the process in Brazil after Rio 92 conference. It's impressive the trajectory of prior sector and step by step we need to learn with the process until you can have what you have today. And now uh, the agroforest system that's not only Amazonia, but you have this really huge uh, project in state of Pará with really good outcomes based on carbon stocks and in, uh, addressing social inequality and sustainability with value supply chains. So my feeling is that we know what you need to do. Uh, we know how to share our technology. We have a really amazing technology developed in Brazil to tackle deforestation, not only to tackle to throw deforestation, but to go into bioeconomy and circular bioeconomy. And my last comment, when you go into- uh, 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 Isabella, Isabella. I'm sorry, just one minute. Yeah, I'm just, sorry. just summarize, summarize. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. I, I want only to make clear that also to go into full circularity of packing, including e-commerce. The strata of the comments is more than 95% of efficient based on packing and e-commerce including. So this is what I think Rocio mentioned, circularity should be included in bioeconomy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Isabella. That is very interesting and showing the importance of having national prayers, governance, and mostly also involving the community, the society. Now, um, I will give one minute or two to the panelists who want to comment. And uh, I already see Rocio, you want to say something? Please. It, just thank you. Have just a quickly. minute. Have a thank minute. You. Um, okay. I thank you. I think just this point, uh, this last point made by Isabella, and we heard it before, landscape governance is starting to make a, a change also in how we see bioeconomy uh, around the world. So I think it is nothing, not new as, uh, as such. But I think it's the way it is applied now, to, uh, starting to be applied for bioeconomy, that's an important aspect. And also a point that Nicholas mentioned about biopackaging. We have started to see some companies in Sub-Saharan Africa working on biopackaging, not necessarily from lignocellulosic, as it is done with those who have the resources, but from starch. So as I said before, how we utilize the supply chains in the global south without really high technological level or high logistics, it could be a, a good way to mobilize uh, bioeconomy without removing it from all the sustainability aspects, the three pillars plus governance. This is the fourth pillar that uh, those who work in sustainability assessment as me are, are utilizing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your intervention. I will now allow us to have a question from video. And then after that, I'll take some questions which are coming from the participants. And then I will post them to the panelist. So time for the video uh, question. Hello, my name is Trina and I'm a startup entrepreneur in the bioremediation and waste to asset space. And my question is, how do we translate these linear notions of growth and scaling up in a circular bioeconomy? Are we able to scale not just in terms of quantities and volumes, but also in terms of biodiversity? Of scaling up uh, 
and as I mentioned before, uh, we, we, can, we are not addressing small projects more. The need to action is really robust and permanent solutions. And for this, we need political and economic support and also innovation must be together and bring people together. If not, uh, as in the past, uh, we have really good experience in my, my country, for example, based on solutions, nature-based solutions and brings communities, but this was not enough to structure robust solution for economic development. And this, unfortunately, uh, indeed, we cannot manage to make sure that we promote GDP growth. So uh, when we're discussing this, we are discussing new economies, new economies, they are coming to change our way to live, to change our way to produce, to change our way to consumer. And we, may, we need to bring this into the core of the debate of national strategy for development. Climate change, biodiversity loss, water stress, these are not only environmental issues. These are critical development issues that we need to face and consider the local reality. We need to address local needs with global core benefits. And for this, uh, scaling, scaling up more than this, to identify the trade-offs. I think the Rosario make this clear how we can indeed go into bioenergy and understand how we, what the change that we need to promote, how we can make it clear for people that they are part of the solution, not part of the problem. This is really important political shift if you want to have a new rea reality in short-term perspectives. Okay, so my feelings is that uh, 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 it's more than the, we agree. We need to be part of the solution. We need to act as a solution. We need to access things, make clear that we can act together. If not, again, we are going to have the ex environmental exclusion as unfortunately we have today, not only social inequality, but also environmental inequality for people that cannot access resource. And when you go into this, we need to understand what hunger means, what no ex energy access means, what no housing means. So how we did we can bring things together, uh, not as a, pro as a, uh, a messiah, but with something that we can have bottom-up approach and make clear the difference among societies. The solution in Germany will not be the solution in Amazon region, be sure. But the spirit, the guidelines, also in Kenya, how we can indeed we address this. My last comment, agriculture, land use uh, uh, strategy, ag approach, agriculture is absolutely key to address solutions, concrete solutions, and also to host the challenge of a circular bioeconomy. This is absolutely concrete because people understand what food means, people understand what water means, people understand what uh, uh, consum consumption means. We need to make it clear, touchable, make clear that we can do this more than as a message. This is part of our behavior. And so we're scaling up to face the challenge, to make it concrete. We need to recognize the different reality, even in Global South. If our ambition is for green Global South, we need to understand how to bring, for example, the forestry countries together. And we don't have an arrangement for this today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Isabella. And uh, I will now take the questions from the panel, uh, from the participants and post them to the panelists. But I want you to remember also something that has come from that video about biomediation in the circular bioeconomy uh, world. The first question goes to Pincenti. What are the limitations of the existing building codes in many countries? Well, in many countries, there are uh, limitations about the building codes to make buildings with timber. For example, the, big, the country that is the biggest producer of timber, that is Russia, don't allow to make uh, buildings higher than three floors. And then, uh, I would say that this is a quest, uh, uh, cultural question. Uh, also in China, the, the regulations are not promoting the, the use of timber. Uh, and in many other places, like in Europe or in America, you know, the regulations are more related with what you want to achieve than not uh, what, which material you want to do. 
For example, the regulations about 90 minutes protection against fire, you can solve using timber or using concrete or using steel. Steel, in fact, is worse than timber in many cases. So what we should do is to have some regulations that are independent from the material um, and then to try to do architecture following uh, these regulations. I think that there are some cultural um, elements uh, related with these regulations. Uh, but I mean, architects will say that in the 19th century, we start to use steel as important material. In the 20th century, we use concrete as the new material. And in the 21st century, the new uh, material for construction will be the timber, the industrialized timber, uh, because it's the only renewable material that we have in front of us. Okay, thank you. Um, and how do you address cultural differences in the promotion of circular bioeconomy? Any one of you can answer. How do you address cultural differences in the promotion of circular bioeconomy? Who want to answer that from the panelists? Let me know. Okay, Rocio, I see your hand up, please. Squiggly, I think that, um, as I mentioned before, I mean, you have to consider for the use of, of bioresources, locality, regionality. So uh, that would be the first, the first thing to address, how, how the resources are being used locally, uh, not just in an indigenous form or not just from traditional uh, communities, in general, how it is used. But that does not necessarily mean there cannot be trade of the bioproducts in other regions or across, across the regions, as long as it is, it is done in a sustainable form. I think that is the way that it can be addressed. And there are several ways of doing it. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, landscape governance could be, could be one, but we heard the presentation in the previous session with FHC. I mean, standards can also be used. Some indicators are now being developed also to ensure that this, uh, uh, the social aspects and the cultural aspects from the social indicators are also considered within this. I think Isabella also gave several examples about that, and we can see them according to the different regions where we are working. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nicolas, want to follow up? Yeah. yeah. I actually wanted to also point out that, that uh, using forest certification uh, standards uh, is a very good tool uh, to have the same rules uh, uh, in, for certain aspects all around. But also uh, you, you, you need to then also keep in mind that, that the same rule, and I don't talk about certification, but, but in, in general, the same rule doesn't work in all countries or, or regions, so I, I, I do I agree very much that, that you need to take into account the regional uh, situation and, and optimize for each region separately. So uh, even within the European Union, I think we, we cannot uh, have one rule for each country when we, we are so diverse. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think the whole idea of um, the world getting more urbanized, uh, they are quite a bit of questions coming into this. Uh, how long does the buildings created with wood last? How are these buildings created with wood going to last? And what about the issues of calamities? Well, uh, you know, there are very old buildings in Russia, in Japan, in China, made with, build, with wood. Uh, more than 500 or even 1,000 years. So I would say that the, the timber is a, a, a very good material and the industrialized timber, that is the, this new generation of timber that is creating panels, the cross laminated timber is even better. So from that point of view, I think that uh, wood is a, a, a good material that can last for for decades and for sometimes for hundreds of years. 
And another important thing is that in general, we mix wood with some other materials like insulation. Sometimes we protect outside. So it's not only wood materials, it's a wood as main structural material, but then there are so many other materials around. And about the resistance, you can uh, design buildings with wood for, I mean, to resist, for example, earthquakes. Wood is a perfect material to resist earthquake. Uh, and about fire, they are better than steel, for example. So I would say that uh, it's, a, it's a cultural question to start to use timber in a new, in a new way. And there are uh, my colleague, from, Niklas, from uh, Finland. Uh, he knows better than us because they have been working for many, many years developing these technologies and making construction using uh, timber. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. There is the question that is relating this session to the session that passed. And it's the whole idea of non-tree forest products, like cosmetics. And the question is, uh, how can they contribute to green economy to address the COVID pandemic? Uh I may I add a comment, Mary, considering okay. I go very, on, Isabella. I mentioned that to have a good experience in Brazil uh, based on the regenerative biocosmetics, cosmetics. Okay, and it's based on, on the product chains that respect nature, animals, and people. And this means that the production keeps the forest alive, standing and regen and also regenerates the greater areas by human activities. This is a private sector approach, okay? And this means that they are looking for also to defend human rights and also be humankind. So when you protect the forest, when you go there, you, you, you avoid it to have a disruptive, uh, to, to, to promote disruption in the ecological cycle based on deforestation, we will avoid exactly uh, the new pandemic crisis and, for example, the, the, the emergence of arbovirus that comes from the, the, the disruptive disruption on the ecological cycles into the forest. So when you have business sector uh, looking for to address solution based on circular economy and also uh, a biocircular economy, uh, doing what? We need to have our business, new business way, bring people together, but you cannot go there based on deforestation. We need to protect and need to restore a degraded area. This is really an impressive approach that you can combine business interests, you can combine the local reality, you can restore degraded areas, and you also can have uh, important industrial uh, uh, biocosmetics uh, strategies to come into the market, not only at the national level, uh, but also in the international level. So uh, this is a really important uh, 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 strategy and vision. This is the sustainability vision for this company in Brazil, as I mentioned before, and they are connect everything exactly based on understanding forest and protection and bioeconomy and also to avoid uh, uh, new uh, emergence of the uh, arbovirus, for example, that will probably become in health crisis based on deforestation. So it's a clear example that's happened today in my country. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have this situation in Brazil, but uh, what I'm seeing here, we have the society reacting and we have other people engaging to go against these setbacks that unfortunately the national government we have managed today in Brazil. Thank you. May I, uh, may I continue? Okay, okay, Nicholas. Yeah, yeah. Very briefly, very briefly, Nicholas. Yeah, I think we all know that the original medicines, they all came from plants and, and from nature. Uh, so there is potential uh, and, and they are used to widely today. But of course, uh, most of the pharmaceutical industry is something else. But I would say that there is a new wave of uh, uh, biopharmaceuticals um, bio-based pharmaceuticals uh, coming up at the moment. Even we have invested in a small company who is extracting uh, uh, from spruce uh, uh, components uh, and, and they can also be used for, for medicinal purposes. So that's very short. And Mary, if, if I may just add to that, I mean, even with the East African strategy, we also made, uh, we conducted some research to see how was the state of the pharmaceutical sector 
for sub-Saharan Africa. And a lot of the uh, traditional medicine is still used, but it is another way to move it forward also within bioeconomy. Okay. This is Nagoya protocol, which is very important. Okay then, okay then. Now I want to just um, quickly uh, wrap up. And uh, this has been a very interesting session and there are a few uh, points just to, uh, to, as a way of wrapping up. Uh, one of the things that has come out from this session is that we need to run from mistakes. Let us not make another 20th century, you know? Uh, so let's make, let's use the lessons that have been learned in going forward. And then the second one uh, is that uh, when we are looking at the issues of uh, bioenergy, let's also be able to consider the related forest residues, you know? And let's also look at cogeneration issues, generating heat as well as power, using residues uh, in respect to bioenergy. In respect to the business, forest-based businesses from a circular bioeconomy perspective uh, is that uh, when we look at ideas that are really patented, really protected, then they take some time, you know, to get actualized or developed even further. And as we look at sustainable cities across, we are looking at the issues of urbanization. In future, a lot of people will be living in the cities. The other point is that as we talk of circular bioeconomy, wherever, we need to look at the issues of national governments and also the society, the community. How are they being involved into these whole issues? And then how are we having national strategies? And then the other thing is that uh, it's also very important when we are looking at the whole bioeconomy, circular bioeconomy issues, to consider rad, landscape governance. And then we look at the issues of regulations and how are these regulations prohibiting or enabling. And with that, I want to bring this session uh, to a close, unless somebody wants to have a very quick wrap up message from the panelists. Thank you, thank you. Nobody can thank you enough. That has been a very good point brought from different perspectives, sustainable cities, bio-based, um, wood-based enterprises from a circular bioeconomy policy issues and also strategies, strategies from the global south and those from the global north. And thank you very much. All the participants, thank you so, so much for all the questions you have sent. A lot of the questions have been responded to by the panelists and we are so grateful for everybody's participation in this session. I saw a quick hand with Nicholas and Isabella crossing oh. remarks. 
Crossing no. remark, Sky Dre. Okay. Nicholas, yeah, what's a crossing I, remark? I, I think one of the key points for any of these uh, uh, processes or products we are thinking about is uh, designing the products for reuse. So in the future, we have to, to uh, understand that everything is circular. So we have to design the products so that they are easy to recycle, to be recycled. So that's, uh, I think, uh, a take home message, uh, how to, to develop uh, any bioeconomy solution. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Recycling in mind. Rocio, one quick closing remark. Three closing words from my side. Reduce, okay. reuse, recycle. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. Vincente, one, two, three words, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you all. Good. Isabella, two, Not three, first. closing words. Human development integrity must be part of this, our solutions. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, everybody. And we bring this uh, session to a close. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care. Yes, thank you very much, Mary, and thanks to the panelists for very interesting discussions about actions and application of circular bioeconomy in various sectors. Very, very interesting. And we will now, uh, we will now take a short five-minute break, and please stay tuned with us, uh, be because after the break, we will have uh, our final plenary sessions. So looking forward to final sessions, and have a nice break. The year 2020 marked a year of change. countries, over 4,000 participants, and 80 side events. The first fully virtual World Circular Economy Forum online took a deep dive into why and how a circular economy can help reboot and build resilience in the economy. Top speakers from around the globe shared practical examples that would help us rebuild our economies stronger, greener, and better. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reshape our economy. During the two days, we heard inspiring examples of solutions for clothing, energy, farming, wastewater, technology recycling, and food. Anyone around the world could take part in the discussions. The key takeaways were that there's no time for short-time fixes, and we need everyone on board. We need to invest in R&D and innovation to accelerate the shift to a circular economy, to build on resource efficiency, resilience and inclusiveness, to engage women and youth to make the circular economy mainstream. We need courageous, caring and collaborative partnerships. And we can turn the economy into a solution by tackling the root causes of global challenges. Join us at the next WCEF events. Thank you for staying with us and I think the last session has led us nicely into our final discussion for today and in this final discussion we will now talk deeper on the circular bioeconomy future and also the need for finding things and our moderator is Justin Adams uh, the co-director of Nature Best Solutions at the World Economic Forum and executive director of the Tropical Forest Alliance. Again, uh, don't forget to put uh, any questions you have uh, for the panelists in the Q&A box. And now I'll give the floor uh, to Justin. 
Uh, over to you, Justin. Thank you so much, uh, Sonia, and great uh, emceeing through the afternoon. So uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate this final panel. Um, as Sonia said, my name is Justin Adams, uh, the Exec Director of the Tropical Forest Alliance. Um, and we've had a wonderful uh, session. I hope you've been with us throughout the, uh, the, 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 the two sessions we've had, and of course the opening uh, with His Royal Highness. Uh, and I think really inspiring to start looking at how we bring this idea of a circular bioeconomy uh, to life. Uh, I think particularly as we start hearing in the last panel some real life examples around um, sustainable timber and use of timber for buildings of bioenergy and how we get that vexing issue right. Uh, the great examples Isabella gave us from uh, agroforestry and Natura and how a very different vision for the Amazon uh, is possible. Uh, and I think around the world, we're seeing how and where this transition could start to take place. What I worry a little bit about is it's still, it probably means a different thing to lots of different people. Uh, and it's certainly not an area that uh, I think has started to mainstream in terms of where and how large scale investment is going to flow. And so what we hope to do with this last panel is to really bring this idea of how we can make this real and how we make this investable. And we've got three uh, great uh, speakers to, uh, to join us. Uh, so let me just introduce uh, each of them and then I'll, I'll go to each of them for, for some opening remarks. But firstly, uh, we will hear from uh, Minister Lee White. Uh, Minister White is the, the Minister for Water, Forests, the Sea and the Environment. Uh, in Gabon, the beautiful uh, um, uh, um, country for, uh, in equatorial Africa, critical part of the Congo Basin. Uh, Minister White is also in charge of climate planning and land use uh, across the country um, and has more than 30 years experience of conservation uh, and working with the forest in, uh, in, in that country. Uh, we'll then turn to Jennifer Price. Jennifer is the president and the CEO of Calvert Impact Capital uh, and for more than 25 years has been really at the heart of uh, and at the forefront of how we drive impact capital into, uh, into um, how we uh, drive social equity and inclusion, uh, but also environment and really excited to hear some of her perspectives as to how we bring impact uh, investors into this space. Uh, and then lastly, we'll hear from Christopher Kaminka, who is the Head of Sustainable Investment Research and Strategy for Lombard ODA, uh, which is a leading uh, asset manager. Uh, and Christopher brings many years experience working in the space. Uh, but uh, I know Lombard ODA has recently launched a circular bioeconomy fund uh, and made some very interesting investments. So really interested and excited to hear directly from him. So that's the, the, the panelists uh, that we've got. So um, I am delighted first to turn uh, to Minister White to talk about what the circular bioeconomy means in Gabon and how do we really bring this to life? Thanks, Justin, and good evening, everybody. Um, my challenge is to is to find a way to make the tropical forests of Gabon valuable, sufficiently valuable to the Gabonese people that they're still standing in 50, 100 years time. Um, tragically, in most tropical developing countries, wood is seen as a source of cheap raw material that gets extracted and, and, and sent far away and, and, and develops um, countries far off the African continent. It's a sort of the tragedy of, of, of development in Africa, the cliche. Um, and when wood is treated that way, what tends to happen is a, a spike in deforestation, degradation, um, you get into a cycle where you, 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 you forfeit your environmental services for the, for the small amounts of money that you make from this raw material. Um, you lose the forests, the ecosystems become more and more degraded. 
Uh, it's bad for the, the health of the planet. It's bad for the health of your nation. Um, and, and so what we're trying to do in Gabon is to, to get away from that, that failed model and, and find a model that will allow us to add value to the forests of Gabon um, through maximizing the, the value of the forest to the Gabonese people by developing things locally. Um, when we exported logs before the president banned export of logs, we were capturing seven, eight percent of the value of our timber and creating you know, six or seven percent of the jobs that potentially we could do. Um, and so if we're going to provide jobs to the 800,000 young Gabonese people who are in school today, we, we, we again, we have to, we have to um, develop our timber resources in country. And if we get that right, um, there are many advantages. If we get that right, if we can create sustainable forestry industries, creating semi-finished or finished products, we can create hundreds of thousands of jobs. And that gives us a constituency of, of, of people who's, who are vested in maintaining the forests. Um, I think that's how we get the Gabonese people to become, as a nation, the, the forest protectors that we need them to be. And we all know that what's at stake. We all know that if we lose the Congo Basin forests, we lose the fight against climate change if our 80, 90 billion tons of CO2 go up into the atmosphere, um, then there's no hope of a 1.5 or a two, two degree world. So we have to find models that, 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 that will work. Um, classically, and if you look around Congo Basin and, and, and West Africa, um, when you do transform timber locally, you use 30% and you burn 70%. We're very inefficient. So, 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 um, what we're trying to do now is to create what we call industrial ecosystems. Um, um, I guess what the world is calling the circular economy. We're creating these industrial ecosystems where in our special economic zone just outside of Libreville now, we have 100 factories transforming Ebony's lumber into finished products. Um, we're up to, we're already up to about 70% efficiency and, and by, by June, July, we'll have new factories going in that will take us beyond 90% um, efficiency in terms of transformation. So all of our waste hardwood is becoming activated charcoal, which is a, 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 you know, a valuable product. All of our waste softer woods will be going into particle boards. And, 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 and so, Developing these these cycles, recycling, using wood as efficiently as we possibly can, maximizing the added value and the job creation in, in Gabon is is the way we think we're going to be able to 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 preserve the the, the Gabonese rainforests into the future. That's a, a wonderful example, and and as you say, losing the fight uh, or losing the Congo Basin, we we lose the fight against climate change and the critical biodiversity challenges we face. Uh, and yet it still feels a, a mountain to climb. We saw statistics or somebody presenting uh, in one of the earlier panels that uh, despite having a forest four times larger and actually larger forest harvest in Africa the, than, than Europe, the European forest product sector uh, was, was worth 100 billion per year versus Africa as a whole was 6 billion per year. Mm -hmm. And so the model you're talking about is one of actually working to develop jobs through a more value added forest industry. Um, but how can that become a norm rather than an exception? And how are you getting on actually making that real uh, in, in Gabon as an example? We have to have examples of where it works. Um, in Gabon, we banned the export of logs over 10 years ago. It's the first thing President Ali Bongo did when he was elected was to ban the export of logs. The Central African Economic Community has just taken a decision now that by the end of 2022, all of our countries will ban log export. Um, when we made that decision, um, one European president came to Gabon tell us what a bad idea it was because 
that country, his country, were going to lose jobs and 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 and, and in, income. So, so the, there's that stress there that that, that if, if you if you if you develop if you develop um, these jobs and this value added in Africa, then then somebody's going to lose out. Um, um, but but as I said, if we can't make these forests precious for the people that live in them and, and, and beside them, then we're going to lose them. And we've seen that in West Africa. Um, what we need is we need a real partnership. If, if we're going to save the Congo Basin Forest, as you said, it's, 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 it's a major challenge. You look at what's going on in the Amazon, and even though the Congo Basin is only a third the size of the Amazon, we're now absorbing more CO2 every year than the Amazon because the Amazon is sick. The Amazon is already responding to climate change. And, and so these Congo Basin forests become more and more vital. Uh, but looking to DRC to the east, um, deforestation rates are already going up. And so we have to do something quickly. Um, things like you know, small payments from the red, process in the UNFCC is not going to do it. We need, what we really need is investment. We need, what I'm trying to do is to bring in responsible investors into Gabon who, who will bring in good um, advanced technology so that we can be as efficient as we possibly can in terms of transforming our, our wood into finished products, get, get, get more and more value out of less and less, and less timber. And if I have um, good investors whose, whose, whose livelihoods rely on Gabonese timber being legal, being sustainable, uh, being good for biodiversity, being good for, 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 for local people, people um, in Gabon, if they're putting pressure on me to improve the governance of the forests, um, that's the way we're going to um, you know, save the Gabonese forest, and, and I think that's the way, perhaps by example, we can then transfer those lessons to other countries. I think it's a, it's a wonderful vision and a wonderful example, and as you said, we need lighthouses of what good looks like and how we can then uh, actually bring other countries to that same aspiration uh, and find different ways of partnering, and I think the, you know, the, this whole inclusive growth and and the global north has a responsibility rather than just protecting jobs uh, in, in, in Europe or in other parts of the world. And obviously China is a key actor here as well. Yet how do we create these new partnerships? But I, I want to turn to Jennifer and bring some of the, the, the other panelists in. You talked about the need for investment. Uh, and uh, But Jennifer, maybe before you get to how we can help Gabon bring, bring more responsible investors to, uh, to support uh, Minister White's vision, yeah. Talk to us about impact capital and the great work you've been doing with Calvert and how that connects to a circular bioeconomy as well, please. Sure, thank you, Justin, and a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so stepping back, um, kind of the big picture, the perspective I bring and where we sit within connecting investor capital to projects and communities. Calvert Impact Capital, I'm based in the United States in Washington, DC, and we work with investors in the global north, United States and across Europe, institution, retail investors, development finance institutions, family offices, high net worth individuals, helping them bring their capital into investments that will have positive impact in society. So they're looking for impact investments where there's measurable change that can be captured in the impact as well as financial return. And we work closely also with communities, ensuring that the right type of capital is reaching projects. We work in, in over 100 countries and across multiple sectors. And so a few just general observations that are, as it relates to the circular bioeconomy conversation, and those are, you know, one, investors talk about components of the circular bioeconomy, so renewable energy, or food to waste regeneration, or forestry and investments in responsible forestry projects. But the investor base is not talking about this larger strategy. 
of a circular bioeconomy. That is not in the lexicon and the investors I speak with. Um, that larger strategy, that um, you know, idea that we have a strategy to get to a carbon neutral outcome is just not brought in. And, and why is that? You know, just a few thoughts that I think then we'll begin to connect to why the capital and how to get the capital into these types of opportunities is one, you know, we measure what matters, so to speak, and what we're measuring now is outputs. So reduction in GHGs or carbon, but we're not measuring this market systems change that is a result of a bio economy, a circular bioeconomy. That's not being captured that market level impact, which is tremendous. Um, and you know, it reminds me very much of gender. I, I've worked within the gender lens investing space for over a decade with um, a growing movement now of investors. And that is one where in the early days, 10 years ago, when we were first participating in that work, there needed to be made a business case. Why gender lens investing? And I heard that over the course of today that it's a 10 trillion dollar opportunity. Um, and then what we need to do though is demonstrate. So minister, you just said we need examples. That's exactly right. I found people need examples. What does that mean in practice? And that did happen with gender. So this idea of demonstrating, then educating, and then leading that to scale. So I think there's great opportunity, but there's an enormous awareness and education that we need to bring into the investor base so they can understand this market impact, this systems change of investing with a circular bioeconomy lens and really bring that into the investment making decision. That's great, Jennifer. And I think, yeah, I think it's really important to highlight just, just how far we've got to go to mainstream this as, a, as an idea. I, I imagine you're seeing more and more investors who are thinking about climate impacts and, and, and what that means. And we've seen this tremendous growth in, in the voluntary carbon markets. Uh, we've seen a tenfold growth, I think, just in the last decade uh, around uh, corporates investing uh, into what are called natural climate solutions. But, but the biggest system change that you're talking about and how we make that attractive, given the, the multiple benefits that come, how, how can we how can we go about that? Or are you saying we, we're still at the education phase from, from, from the, the, the many investors you speak to? And I, I guess maybe to link that, what would make, what would make it attractive for, for the, the Minister White's uh, um, you know, great new forest products industry that they're building outside Libreville? How do we make that attractive to, uh, to the type of investors you're speaking to? Yeah, it, it, it's a big question and a great one because it's definitely where we need to get to. And I, I do think we're on the early end, but there's a lot of evidence and a lot of the components of this work happening. So how do we educate, build a narrative, and then bring investment opportunities and products back to investors so they can easily access these investment opportunities, which I'm sure my colleague Christopher is going to get into. You know, one of the challenges where I work, which is more in the private market space of the finance continuum, so often working with blended finance, you know, transactions that are bringing government, nonprofits, and investors together and blending their capital, is they are difficult transactions. They can take time, mm. um, and they are hard at times for investors to easily put money to work in. So I think there's a whole conversation we can have about how do we make it more accessible and easy for investors to engage in these types of investment opportunities. Um, but I think there's also a piece the minister said that's really vital. Um, that is changing behavior, both of the people um, to see this as a natural resource of generations to come and of investors investing not just in a project, but in a larger thesis. And so my example I can give on this one is we were an investor in the first blue bond, um, the Seychelles mm -hmm. issued a blue bond. It was a sovereign debt obligation. So we as investors were betting on the country and the rising economic uh, benefit of a blue economy of a protected marine area to that economy's um, wealth and growth over the next decade. And for that bond to really work, um, the government and the people needed to see the value in that asset. 
so that the tourism businesses, the educational sector, the small fishers, um, all were motivated to change their practices to be more sustainable and really protect that natural resource of the ocean. So I think there's more I can get into on the details of that transaction, but I think it's illustrative of what's possible um, in really starting to value the whole resource, not just a sliver of it, not just one business, and bringing that value proposition to the investor base. Wonderful. Well, let's let's come back to that in a moment. Uh, and uh, but I think the Seychelles is a great example of a sort of a package deal or a blended finance deal that brought different investors with different risk appetites together as well. But let's turn to Christopher and bring him into the conversation. Uh, and would love to learn more about the fund and and how you see this uh, this whole sector developing and uh, and and what you're looking to try and do with the fund. Sure. Thank you so much. So it's been a great conversation so far. Maybe I'll give you a little bit of a different perspective. And we can start really by going back up to the macro level. We're an investor in global markets, right? So we're a $350 billion asset management firm and private bank. And we invest in stocks and bonds. We invest in companies. We also invest in projects where a lot of the discussion has been focused. But for the most part, we invest in stocks and bonds issued by companies. And so for us, natural capital is a central investment thesis for investors. And we find it's a, actually a very commonplace discussion that we have with our clients. But you do have to spend a little time unpacking it a little bit. And when you consider that half of our global GDP, and we can have a discussion about whether GDP is the right metric to discuss natural capital on, but take it as it is, half of our economy relies on natural capital. And the problem is that our economy, our prevailing economy is a linear one. You all know this. It's a take, make, waste economy. We take too much of the natural capital. Um, we make stuff with it that we don't really use much of the time. Uh, we generate an enormous amount of waste and a lot of it's toxic to the natural capital that we're taking from in the first place. And you know, hardly any of it has any price on it, but it's got insurmountable, uh, you know, unlimited value. So, so this is the investment thesis, why investors should care, really should care about in, uh, natural capital, because so many of the world's industries are dependent on it from the pharmaceutical industry. Many people know that the pharmaceutical industry is worth a trillion dollars per year, but some people might be surprised to learn that over 60% of new drugs introduced are linked to natural products and biodiversity. It's the same for the agricultural industry, uh, the, the blue economy. All of these big parts of the global economy are relevant to natural capital, and it's in a state of a decline, and it's, it's really a, a very a very dangerous state of affairs for investors. So our natural capital fund, we think it's the first of its kind to invest in small to mid cap companies that are involved in their business models in either harnessing natural capital, the power of natural capital for growth, the circular bioeconomy, we can talk about that, or they're investing in companies that are preserving natural capital through the industrial circular economy, resource efficiency, the outcome-oriented economy, these revolutions that we're seeing in more efficient and productive use of our natural capital, zero waste, the move to our zero waste economy. So that's what our natural capital fund does in a nutshell. It creates an opportunity for investors to position capital into companies that we think are going to ride a wave of innovation and change in the economy as it changes as, it, uh, as a metamorphosis occurs from this linear economy to a circular bioeconomy with two wings, harnessing nature and preserving nature. And if you like, we can discuss some of those investment opportunities and some of the uh, revolutions that we see uh, happening. Well, why don't, why don't you give one, two examples of, of the types of things that you see as really revolutionary and bringing, bringing this whole vision of the circular bioeconomy to life? I think that would be really valuable for the audience. Sure. So why don't we talk about the circular bioeconomy first, since that's that's exactly what you just said. So here, what we see is companies through technology are beginning to unlock the secrets of nature. And Mark Palahi uh, likes to say that nature has a two billion year head start on us at figuring out, you know, how companies uh, really should operate 
uh, nature is incredibly efficient at what it does because it's had so much time to figure out the most efficient and effective way to do it. But now because of technological innovation and, and all of the rapid advancements that we've seen in recent years going exponential, we're starting to unlock those secrets, biomaterials, bioenergy, um, all of the different uh, water and smart agriculture related implementations of technology to harness the inherent power, the regenerative nature of natural capital. And there, are, there we've identified 350 companies that are involved in synthetic biology or in fixing the broken water system or in fixing the broken agriculture system. And then maybe I'll just end with something on the circular economy side here, industry 4.0, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, step function changes in productivity where you can generate value by using new technological capabilities that lessen the reliance on natural capital in the first place. Wonderful. So lots and lots of opportunity all, all starting to bubble up. You, you can just sense the enthusiasm as you're, uh, as you're speaking. I want to just address a paradox, though, that for me is something I struggle with for, and, 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 and maybe throw it open to each of you. you know, the, the, what we're talking about is using, we're still working with natural resources. So we're still working with forests. We heard from Minister White, right? We're taking timber, but we're turning it into added value and, and, and avoiding the waste. Um, that, how, do, how do we address that paradox when so many environmental organizations are screaming about the degradation of natural capital and therefore that we've got to protect everything, right? And so there's this paradox of, of protecting everything and supporting biodiversity, but at the same time, making it valuable, creating jobs. And so I, 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 that's, that's something that it's, I remember the first conversation I had with a, uh, with a major investor on some of this a few years ago, and they said, you're talking to us about we want to try and restore forests and protect forests, and yet you're telling me we're trying to use wood products. And so there's sort of how do we articulate that and 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 find ways of sort of demonstrating that this is a both and conversation. And if we don't put people in the middle of it, we'll 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 fail. And so maybe Minister White, you could you could pick that up first, and then uh, would luck to each of you is how do we how do we message around some of this complex. Um, so you're asking the the guy who for 35 years was a conservationist um, working for WCS and then running the the National Park Service in Gabon, why he's now cutting trees down as the Minister of Forestry, I think. <laughs> I thought you'd be a good person to answer that uh, <laughs> conundrum. You know, it's... We have to find a way to make the forest valuable if the forest is going to survive. We have to find a way to develop nations without going through that catastro catastrophic deforestation curve. And we, you know, we cite Costa Rica as an example of a sustainable economy. Well, they actually trashed their forest and what they've been incredibly good at is bringing it back because they realized how bad it was for their country to have destroyed the ecosystem services and, and you know, a huge lesson to learn there. Um, for Gabon, about 10 years ago, we, we turned our back on the red process and the climate change negotiations because we decided as a high forest, low deforestation country in a system that was which was putting more value on deforestation than on actually maintaining the forests, that, that that wasn't going to give us the scale that we would need if we were going to actually save the 88% land cover that we have of our forests. And so we, 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 we've been looking for a model that will preserve the forest. We, we have 21% of our land in protected areas. So, so we're not exploiting all of it, we're setting aside the most biodiverse areas um, because when you log a tropical forest, even if it's low intensity, sustainable, selective logging, where you're only cutting a couple of trees per hectare, you're still going to lose maybe 10% of your biodiversity. And if that's the 10% that's the most rare, the most endemic, the most unusual, 
the most sensitive, that may well be the, the 10% that, that Christopher is looking to develop with his pharmaceutical industries. So we have to keep them in, in, in and so we have to maintain intact forests because it's you know, the, the biodiversity value is probably much, much higher even than the, the potential immediate timber value. Um, but if we don't find a way to, 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 to you know, put a dollar figure almost on the value of, of, of the, the forest land, then the forest land is going to become oil palm land or soya bean land or, 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 or cattle ranching land. Um, and the great thing about forests is that if you manage them, um, they can live basically forever. And we, we have some amazing examples in Europe of, of, of ancient forests. Maybe once they were sort of royal estates, but now they're, they're, they're managed forests um, that have trees that are hundreds of years old and, 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 and are maintaining both, you know, providing value, but providing ecosystem services. And, and, and we see with climate change that the more biodiverse those forests are, the more resilient they are to climate change. And so our mono-dominant stands are either in Europe or all burning in the Mediterranean and dying of insect disease in the, in the north. And so maintaining nature, but harvesting nature, perhaps mimicking your harvesting on those natural processes that you have in the forest. Trees do grow and fall down and create light gaps. And so, and so we, we, we can um, mimic that. Um, and by maintaining the, the functionality of the ecosystem at the same time as, as maximizing the value that we get out of every cubic meter and minimizing the waste. You know, it's a crime to be less than 90% efficient in your use of this, this precious resource. Um, and to do that, you do need this, you know, the circular, the, the, the sort of the ecosystem of, of, of industry, not just an ecosystem of forest, but an ecosystem of industry. Um, and it's starting to work. We're starting to add value. We're creating jobs. We've, we've by banning the export of, of, of uh, logs uh, in 10 years, we've multiplied our economy times four and our job number times three. Um, and, and we believe strongly that as we become more and more sophisticated in the transformation, we can, we can multiply by three and by three again. Um, and, and so as a conservationist who, <coughs> who's helped to create almost 50 probably protected areas in, 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 in the Congo Basin, um, I see a real synergy between the protection and the sustainable use um, I think the NGOs that lobby against tropical timber, um, they're, they're, I mean, obviously they, they, they're well motivated. They think that's the way you, you save the, the forest. But for Congo Basin, um, I think if we were to ban sustainable forestry tomorrow, we would lose the Congo Basin forests. Um, and we cannot afford to do that, as I said. Yeah, wonderful and deeply insightful. Uh, Jennifer, uh, can pull you into to this same conversation where with where investors are today how, how do we bring them into the conversation yeah yeah thank you and just moving right from the minister's comments i can again go back to the seychelles example because what i've noticed in doing this work this transition phase that the minister was articulating at times we need to free up resources for the country and also you know, alleviate pressure on the natural, natural resource so it can regenerate. And, you know, specifically in the Seychelles transaction, what that meant was the debt swap for nature that was a precursor to the issuance of the blue bond was a vital component. That debt swap for nature was supported by the Nature Conservancy and the World Bank, and it refinanced the Seychelles um, debt obligations to a lower rate so they could free up some cash. Freeing up that cash enabled them to map the ocean floor, monitor that natural resource in a responsible way. It was vital for creating the right ecosystem to then responsibly finance, responsibly monetize that asset. And if likewise, you look closely at the blue bond transaction itself, 
there was blended finance in there. There was risk capital sitting beneath the senior capital, which was vital to blend down that cost of capital for the government of the Seychelles so that that capital could be invested at a low cost rate and therefore support some of the efforts um, around business that just weren't market rate opportunities. You know, specifically we needed, you know, some pressure taken off the asset. We couldn't fish it as hard. And so, you know, ensuring the livelihood of those small fishermen's businesses was vital. And so we needed to help them, um, you know, in a way uh, subsidize that period of time when they weren't actively um, fishing so robustly. So just some, you know, through the transition, I think thinking creatively about finance and being aware that we need to make sure that the capital we're putting into these projects is priced right and the tenor is right um, so that the investor capital is really aligned with all the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And Christopher, how with your investors, but also with the entrepreneurs and the businesses you're investing in, how, how do you wrestle with some of these sort of dilemmas and the complexity of what we're what you're trying to, to do here? Well, that's a, it's a tough question. Uh, we're, we try to be students of the dynamics in this space. We try to keep a close tab on policy and regulatory forces that are evolving, and there are many of them. We try to very closely focus on market forces and what's happening with the economics of this entire space. And we look at investor behavior, patterns of investment, and consumer behavior. So this is really the conversation that we have with our investors and what we do internally, what we try and keep track of. So in the policy space, what we observe is that there are more and more regulations and policy interventions that are changing the calculus. And they're pushing the economy away from this linear type of economy towards a more circular economy. They can be, you know, pretty standard carbon pricing, water pricing, other types of putting a price on uh, natural capital uh, that has, as, as we uh, discussed before, uh, limitless value. It could be payments for ecosystem services. Which, which are starting to um, gain traction. Here we also see uh, extended producer responsibility, you know, getting more into the um, circular economy side of things. This is a real thing. EPR is a real thing. And companies are starting to have to grapple with the full life cycle of the products that they create and the financial and the physical costs uh, that may stick with them. It's the same with climate, scope three, upstream, downstream emissions. So we see plastics taxes, we see prices, you know, water pricing in California, water futures being launched. Natural capital is getting priced and investors are starting to figure that out. And the thing is that change tends to happen slowly and then all at once, you know, the market has a tendency to pull forward transitions. Once a critical mass of investors understand that a new paradigm is, 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 is occurring, that we're at some type of a tipping point, the market will pull that forward. And that can be a, a pretty aggressive uh, repricing that can occur. So we want to be ahead of that, right? That's, that's very important for us because market forces are super powerful. And what we're seeing is that the circular option is becoming the cheaper one. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, you uh, see this. One, yeah. Yeah. So one, one quick follow-up on that is, is, and are you seeing as well interest and increased appetite for investments in the global South or is, are these investments going to continue to be, and this isn't in any way critical, but, but are the investments going to continue to be with, you know, with the innovators in Europe and North America or where the, the, Political risks may be smaller, but a lot of what we've heard this afternoon is around the kind of huge need in the global south as well, if we bring this vision to life for a, for a global circular bioeconomy. So, again, very good question, hard, difficult to answer, but what we observe is that there is no lack of innovation and advancement in the global south. It's it's full of it, and, and that's fantastic. The situation is that the global capital markets, as we know, are not as deep and not as pervasive in the global south. And as investors who operate in liquid global capital markets, you know, that's a real issue for us. We want to see, talking about the debt market, we need to see, you know, more investment grade issuers. We need to see 
at development banks helping cities to achieve, you know, um, in, uh, a credit rating so that we can invest in the bonds coming out of uh, ur urban environments. We, we need to see a lot more focus from the development banks to unlock um, you know the capital markets in the in the global south uh, in, in in developed countries. We have enormous appetite to go and invest there, but we need to see a development of the investment vehicles and the liquidity and the you know the taxation rules, the repatriation, all of that uh, that we need to see uh, in order to invest in, in order to invest in a prudent way. Thank you. And sorry for peppering you with just hard questions. Uh, we're, we're running tighter on time, and I know the organizers want to try and wrap uh, uh, overall. So, and I also know we've got lots and lots of great questions uh, from, from the audience. So I'm going to apologize that we're not going to be able to get to them all. Uh, but uh, I think in the interests of, of respecting people's time, I want to turn to each of you, just giving you a 30 second, one minute kind of maximum Kind of reflection of what is going to be needed to bring this wonderful vision what's the one two things that's needed to bring this vision to life um and uh, and then we will uh, then we'll then we'll we'll wrap but minister to you first i think for, for me i think we need to see government to government engagement between developed and developing countries um and, and rather than thinking about um, sort of handouts, international aid money, um, I want to see developed nations encouraging their industries to come and invest in, 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 in our countries. We, we know there are challenges. We know we have to improve the business environment. We have to improve the governance. Um, I think, um, you know, with, with the, the challenge we all have of, of dealing with climate change and dealing with the, the biodiversity crisis, we, we, we need to do it together. And, and um, when there's a government to government relationship on top of a government to private sector relationship, then, then, then I, you, you tend to be able to resolve issues that, that, that might not be possible when it's just the private sector. Couldn't agree more. Wonderful. Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I heard His Royal Highness say this morning, we have the capital, it's how we deploy it. And so I would just echo that sentiment. And with the how we deploy it, just ensuring it's the right capital for where that project or that community is. Um, and so at times, um, as I share, that can take blended finance, the blending and threading of multiple sources of capital um, it can take participation across many different types of actors, government, NGOs, private capital. Um, and that can be tough and messy stuff, but at times we'll need to do that so we can really demonstrate and then get to the place where we can scale it to some of the requirements that Christopher articulated the capital markets are seeking and, and will need to really invest scaled capital. So I, we're on the right path and, you know, now, how can we accelerate and grow? Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Christopher. So I very much agree with Jennifer. We're, we are on the right path uh, and with the minister as well. You know, we, we are on the right path. And I would just say for us, it's about this interplay between policy and regulation and market forces. That's what's so important. Policy ambition, keep the eye on the ball. Keep the keep you know keep on increasing that policy ambition. The private sector will respond. Companies will see the shape of the path ahead. They will innovate. They will invest. Venture capital will flow into it. Money will flow where uh, it'll chase returns and it's going to chase growth. And so as that you know interplay continues to um, escalate, as as we continue to see circular becoming cheaper, you know consumer demand will start uh, flooding in that direction, and investors will follow. Great. Uh, so thank you all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really buzzing after the discussion and I wish we could go a little longer. So uh, and, and, and really, uh, really rich input from all of you. So I, I just have a few very quick remarks to try and sort of wrap some of it up. But I love the idea. We are on the right path. And undoubtedly, this vision of a circular bioeconomy is the right vision. And I want to just thank the organizers 
um, uh, for their vision in, in putting the event on and for bringing the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance to, to life, uh, I think there's, there's huge, huge potential here. Secondly, uh, I think it's also clear, though, that it's still very nascent. Not everybody uh, understands this. There's huge education uh, needs. And as we're starting to think about some of the opportunities, it's going to be messy because we need to bring different types of capital, different types of stakeholders together uh, to figure out how we're going to unlock the huge opportunity that, that I think everybody can feel. And we've had great examples of this afternoon. Uh, but I think we shouldn't underestimate now the challenge of, of bringing this to life. Uh, I think thirdly, then, what we really need is the examples. And there's great examples of innovators and companies, the types of companies Christopher uh, is investing in his portfolio. Uh, but also, I think the type of example that the minister so, uh, um, so inspiringly laid out in terms of how do we actually shift to nature-based, bio-based, sustainable economies of the future. And I think that's going to be particularly important as we look to build back from the ravages of COVID. How can we actually support countries like Gabon stand up and shine as the lighthouses we need of actually what this can look like in the future? Because we need the Congo Basin, we need the Amazon Basin uh, to still be standing in 50, 100 years if we have any chance of addressing the critical crises we face. So that, I think, becomes so important. And I think lastly, and a point uh, we heard from uh, Isabella in the previous panel, you know, we have to put people to the center of this because that's actually ultimately what's going to drive the innovation it's going to be what drives the investment uh, and crucially drives the inspiration for why and how we can bring this circular bioeconomy to life and i think that will make it all much more investable uh, and we will see uh, the big wall of capital that prince charles talked about right at the beginning but we've got there's a lot of work to get to, to get it to work and to get it to work in all the right places but i want to thank you all for a really rich discussion i want to thank the organizers for a great uh, session and uh, and thank all of the audience for their attention and apologies we haven't got to uh, to the questions but uh, thank you all and i hand back uh, to the wonderful sonia uh, i think to bring us to a close yeah, thank you very much, Justin, uh, for very uh, inspiring discussions. And sadly, it now brings us to the end of our event. And I hope all of you have enjoyed this discussion as much as I have. And we have known that uh, the circular bioeconomy is a complex topic. The strategies are still being decided. The financing, especially in the global south, still needs to come in. And there is still research that needs to be done. And we also heard from many esteemed speakers today about the need for putting nature at the heart of the economy, urging those making investment to make long-term decisions with people and also planet in mind. And we learn about the need for more research to understand the relation, relationship between nature, people, and economies. And we also heard from the environment ministers about new opportunities to manage ecosystems more sustainably while providing higher value products and also jobs. But for sure, we do know that circular bioeconomy approach offers a solution to our current challenges from accelerating climate change to biodiversity loss and also to incur inequality. And most importantly, we need massive investment in the global south and collaboration between industrialized and developing economies. And in a nutshell, uh, it's time to just do it and make this investment and take the steps to act. And thank you for following our discussion along. And we had a lot of interest in this topic with 3,000 registered participants watching on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, it's generating more than 2 million reach in the social media. And before, before you leave us, uh, I would like to inform you that we will send along an email in the coming days with a very short survey. We would like to know uh, what you thought about the event and also about the discussion through the survey. So please uh, take a look at the, the surveys. I think it just needs a few minutes to share your inputs and keep following us on social media where the conversation will continue. Uh, finally, I'd like to give a big thanks uh, to our partners in this event, the European Forest Institute, the Finnish Innovation Fund, CITRA, the Sustainable Market Initiatives, and the Global Landscape Forum, or GRF. 
And GLF will host several important events this year, including a GLF Digital Forum on Forest Landscape Restorations, hosted jointly by the Collaborative Partnership on Forest and the Global Partnership on Forest and Landscape Restoration on April 29. We also have a GLF Africa on 2nd and 3rd of June that will focusing on dry land restoration and it is aligned with the kickoff of the UN Cape of Ecosystem Restorations. Uh, this will be also followed by a deep dive into the state of the world's largest tropical forest ecosystem um, in GLF Amazon, as well as, uh, as well as a climate and finance related conferences later in this year. So thank you and hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. Have a nice day. The year 2020 marked a year of change and adaptation. The COVID-19 pandemic washed across the world and damaged our economies. At the same time, a rapid transition to a circular economy is more important than ever. The whole world needs to find ways to get back on its feet. And we have a unique opportunity to support the sustainable recovery of our economy with circular solutions. Two days, six sessions, 50 speakers, 123 countries, over 4,000 participants, and 80 side events. The first fully virtual World Circular Economy Forum online took a deep dive into why and how a circular economy can help reboot and build resilience in the economy. Top speakers from around the globe shared practical examples that would help us rebuild our economies stronger, greener, and better. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reshape our economy. During the two days, we heard inspiring examples of solutions for clothing, energy, farming, wastewater, technology recycling, and food. Anyone around the world could take part in the discussions. The key takeaways were that there's no time for short-time fixes, and we need everyone on board. We need to invest in R&D and innovation to accelerate the shift to a circular economy, to build on resource efficiency, resilience and inclusiveness, to engage women and youth to make the circular economy mainstream. We need courageous, caring and collaborative partnerships. And we can turn the economy into a solution by tackling the root causes of global challenges. Join us at the next WCEF events.